You are now tuned into Progressive Action Radio, the most objective show in America. Hosted by Tramel Thompson, co-hosted by Jamel Wilson, and DJ Damage is on the wheels of steel. You will never know what to expect when thoughts and wisdom unite. People. Get ready. 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 Progressive action is now live. What's going on today, man? What's going on, cuz? I'm doing great, man. How you feeling today? I'm feeling good. You know, um, I just feel like special, good vibes today in the building. Oh, I feel excellent vibes in the building. I, I know. Got, I got my tie on with both, you know, you got your blazer on for the first time we've seen you. I'm, and I got my tie on and my, I got my sweater vest on. So I am, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about tonight. The last time you was dressed like this, Anita Clinton was in the building. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so we know a special guest is in the building today. <laughs> 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 Jam- oh, Jamel, Jamel, he sturdied up today. I'm, I'm very happy. Um, you know, last week's show it was, a, it was a good show. It was a rebuttal show. Well, um, Joe Campbell, he came and just basically rebutted everything that Steve Downs had to say. Basically ripped it to shreds a little something too. I mean, he did it for sure. But we don't want to waste too much time with uh, last week. We on a new week, and who we got in the building today? We have. New York State Assemblyman, Mr. Charles Barron, representative of the 60th District in Brooklyn. How are you feeling this evening, Mr. Barron? My well, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to love y'all, man. I'm here for two hours, and we're going to throw down. Oh, yeah. We know, gonna th- uh, uh, I feel good about being in here, and uh, thank you for the invite, man. I thank you for the invite. We're more than happy to have you. See, look, now... Th- Mr. Barron just set the, bar- the, the level high. We got a New York State Assemblyman here at 12 a.m. <laughs> 12 a.m. This man is in Albany. This man is moving all through New York State, New York City. I don't want to hear none of y'all TWU Local 100 people is too busy with y'all part-time <laughs> two $300,000 <000 laughs> positions. I don't want to hear that. That's not going down. But Mr. Charles Barron. For the people who don't know, can you please enlighten them who you are? Well, you know, I uh, spent 12 years in the city council. Well, let me go back even before that. I grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the Lillian Wall Projects, the PJs. You know, I know they call them <laughs> housing <laughs> development. I grew up in the PJs, man. <laughs> exactly. Right. In the Lillian Wall, the houses on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And, and my first uh, 16 20 years of life, you know, I did everything that everybody does when you're out in the neighborhood. But then about 17 years old, I ran into brothers from the Black Panther Party. They used to come down to the Lower East Side and, you know, talk a lot of stuff. I did some community organizing. So when it came down, I used to actually argue with them and debate them. I said, come on, how you all can be revolutionaries? You got the big sign up there, Black Panther Party. They're going to blow you all away. <laughs> Y'all can't be for real. Okay. So they said, no, 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 brother. Come on up to Harlem. Because I was on Avenue D and 6th Street and Low East Side. I went up to Harlem, and I saw, you know, free breakfast program for the children, giving out free clothing. And I saw brothers and sisters reading books. I thought, you know, when we get in there, the first thing they're going to give you is a gun and you're going to learn how to use that. <laughs> so, you know, when you come from the neighborhood, you say, can't wait to get up in the Panthers, man, get them guns. Hey, they say, here's your weapon, a book. And we had to read books and get political education. Uh, Miles' Little Red Book, The Axioms of Kwame and Krumah, and every book on revolution, on change, on Malcolm X, on communism, socialism, capitalism. You had to know your stuff. And then the international struggles. It seems like all of America's heroes were my enemies. You know, everybody that America liked, I didn't. And everybody I liked, America didn't like. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're in Vietnam. I like Ho Chi Minh, the North Vietnamese. They like the South Vietnamese guy. Okay. You know, we look at Cuba. I like Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. They was with, <laughs> <laughs> they was with the dictators, you know. So um, that's where I got most of my political education. And then after that, I joined the Black United Front with Reverend Herbert Daughtry. 
And we did a whole lot of work in 1980. We had the uh, Black United Front. We took care of every issue you could think of. And then, after the Black United Front, I wanted to look at the question of power. You've got to have power. Somebody has to give black radical people some power, power over resources. And that's when I began to look at electoral politics. I never wanted to be a politician. Matter of fact, I used to fight them all the time. But I knew that they were wielding too much power. In most of the black communities, there's these black sellout Negroes with all the power, but controlled by the white boys in the Democratic Party. So we would always run against, we didn't have no money, no resources, no power, but we had a strong voice and we were doing some strong things. So I thought if I brought that kind of black radical politics into the electoral arena, okay. not this soft stuff, but real strong, that we can make a difference. Okay, now, um, you know, you said when you first joined the Panthers, they had you reading books. What is your educational background? I got a GED, so I just want to let y'all know, anybody <laughs> out there, that brothers and sisters, think something's wrong with a GED. The assemblyman is a GED assemblyman. <laughs> shout out to all the GEDs. <laughs> shout the out people to with the GEDs. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's right, that's right. Uh, up, no, well, no, we keeping it real. Y'all gonna learn a lot of new uh, things right. tonight. GED, Mama on Welfare, in the projects, and now there's New York State Assemblyman. But I do have a uh, associate's degree in, from CUNY, New York City. Uh, well, it was community college then. It's New York City Technical College now. And I have a bachelor's degree from uh, Hunter College. But my real education was in the streets uh -uh. because none of that stuff has really helped me to be where I am now. Nothing like it, you know. It's a different type of education. It sure is. You got to have your PhD from the streets because all that other stuff. You know, we live in a. Let me not discourage brothers and sisters. Go get your degrees because this is a <laughs> this is a credential oriented society. So just get the credentials and then get the real education by joining organizations, listening to programs like this to get the real education. Just give them what they are requiring from you so that you can master all of that stuff and then go get the real education yeah. in the now, streets. Now, one thing I want to ask real quick is when it comes to the Black Panthers, and did, did they create the WIC program? <laughs> no, they didn't create. You know what they did create, though? They did create free breakfast programs. And when they did that for the um, children, do you know, and they don't say this about the Panthers, 22 states across the United States pass legislation to give free breakfast to children in elementary schools. This was after the Panthers did it in 67, 68, started in 65, but 67, 68, it was real strong. 22 states followed suit. It wasn't just us feeding children in the morning. We influenced states across the country. Then we had survival packages. Because you know, one of the things we always said, you gotta survive pending the revolution. So the revolution ain't here. In the meantime, you got to eat. You got to have some clothing. You got to have some food on the table, some jobs. You got to have those in the meantime things. So that's what the Black Panther Party would always do, survival programs pending the revolution. In the meantime, we got to do certain things. Electoral, electoral politics is something we do in the meantime. But ultimately, we need to radically change America. America needs a revolution. So how did you feel when uh, Beyonce and her uh, Super Bowl performance, and she got a lot of backlash because it was like Pantherish? Or <laughs> you know. I said, go ahead, Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of the Panthers, said, oh man, she's wearing skimpy clothing and doing that. And some of them didn't appreciate it. I said, listen, when, when Beyonce got up there and sang the national anthem and everything, they loved her. The minute she honored the Panthers, you know, the slightest things we do, that was not really a revolutionary act. That was a bold thing for the sister to do. I appreciated it, and I'm glad she did it. And every time we get these artists to do anything that has any semblance of consciousness, we gotta give them their due. Mm -hmm. We gotta say right on, you know, that was a good thing to do. And look, what the, look at the heat she got. See, this is what this system does. John Carlos and Tommy Smith, y'all remember them in the 68 Olympics when they gave yes. the yeah, black yeah, yeah. power suit? Yes. 
that that mean a black power salute at the American flag? You lucky we're not talking about scorched earth. You lucky we're not talking <laughs> about arm the masses and tear this place up. You just do a little black power salute at a flag during the national anthem. These brothers caught hell. John Carlos's wife committed suicide. Wow. They couldn't get any jobs for a salute. Beyonce, it's a good thing that she's well off and they can't hurt her. But she just, you know, honored the Black Panther's 50th anniversary with a little outfit and, you know, little number, and they had a fit. Yeah, they went even as far as to protesting at the NFL offices in, in Manhattan. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Because they want to keep these powerful entertainers. You know, if the athletes and entertainers ever got their stuff together, Man, we can rock this nation. So the minute they take a step in that direction, they wanted to use her as an example. You, you try it. Try stepping out of line and see what we do to you. And they tried to use her as an example, but she rose above it. You know, she, she's a powerful sister, mm -hmm. and she rose above it. So we need more like that because what they do is they frighten you. I said a little thing. Uh, and it stayed with me for the rest of my career. They bring it up every time. I was at a reparations rally, and I remember about 60,000 people there. The December 12th movement organized it. And we were talking about reparations. We've been enslaved for 246 years, 1619 to 1865. That's 246 years of slavery. Mm -hmm. Then that's if you're counting the English slavery. Prior to 1619, the Spaniards brought us here in the 1500s. So if you count the Spanish enslavement, that's 339 years of slavery. If you just do the English, you know, they always say 1619, Jamestown, Virginia, 20 Africans. No, we were here before that. Yeah. But just taking that, how are you going to enslave us for 246 years? And then in 1865 to 1965, another 100 years of Jim Crow racism, mm -hmm. and then say, okay, y'all free. Uh, I mean, and, then mass incarceration kicked in. Mass incarceration, <laughs> you still ain't free. You're still not free. So I was at a rally, and to show you how they, they don't even want you to say anything to fight them. So I, I got on the stage, and the people were making a little noise. You know, Farrakhan had spoken, and Jesse had spoken, and I've never seen crowds, you know, making noise when they speak. So I got up half fooling around, half serious. I said, man, y'all be still. You know, what you be still? Why we got to talk when speakers are talking? So I was messing around, and they got quiet. I said, oh, man, now I got to say something. You know? <laughs> so, so I said, um, you know, reparations. We sitting there on some lawn talking about reparations. Let's go to the Treasury Department. Let's take our reparations. They said, yeah. There ain't even no money in the Treasury Department. <laughs> <laughs> they got checks. They write checks. They write checks. <laughs> so I'm talking trash, right? <clears throat> and then I said, matter of fact, when I get back to New York for my black mental health, I'm going to slap the first white man in power and tell him it's a black thing. They said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I forgot... ABC, NBC. All of them was watching. New York One. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot I was an elected official. <laughs> when I got back to New York, brothers, <laughs> everybody went crazy. And all of my colleagues, they said, man, everybody, the media is calling us up, and they want us to denounce you, said you had a, a racial slap, a racial slur. I said, what are y'all talking about? They said, where were you? I said, I was at a reparation rally. I was on this program the next morning, this conservative program. I knew they had the quote. So they said, um, and I had promised I'd come on and debate with them about reparations. Okay. So they said, uh, um, good morning, uh, uh, councilman. That's when I was a councilman. They said, councilman, good morning. How you doing? I knew they had it. So I said, great. It's a great day to be alive. <laughs> I'm just so honored to be alive on this planet. So they said, uh, uh, council member, we have a quote from the Associated Press. Did you say, uh, for my black mental health, you're going to slap the first white man you see and tell him it's a black thing? <laughs> did, you, did you say that, Councilman? I said, absolutely. That's absolutely what I said. 
Yeah. Honesty is the best policy. Oh, yeah, definitely. You got, you got to get it out your system sometimes. If you hold, if you hold, if, 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 Listen, if you, if you behind, hold it, it's no good. Behind every joke, there's a sense of the truth. Don't Listen, now, hey, like, now, right, right, right on time with that. Let me tell you what I did next. That's what's right on time. Wait till you hear it. So next, they said, um, I said, yep, absolutely. And they got silent. So, Councilman, are you there? I said, I said, yes, that's what I said. <laughs> so he said, uh, could you explain, you know, why, what you meant by that? So just to mess with their heads, I said, yes, it was a case of uh, oratorical improvisation and black hyperbole. <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> I said, oratorical <laughs> improvisation and a black hyperbole. He said, he said, what's a black hyperbole? I said, well, sir, a hyperbole is a figure of speech. You know, you have metaphors, you have similes, you stretch, you stretch it out. and you have a hyperbole. Yeah. Right. I know what a hyperbole is. I said, why'd you ask me? He said, he said what's a black hyperbole? I said, oh, 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 oh. Uh, a hyperbole is a gross exaggeration. So a black hyperbole is like when I got on my mother's last nerve, on uh, Sunday, she said, boy, I will slap you into Tuesday. Now, <laughs> exactly. that's a hyperbole. Right. That doesn't mean I was going to miss Monday. Monday was still going to happen. That's a hyperbole. So he said, could you, could you tell me another one? I mean, another one? Black hyperbole? I said, yeah, um, yes. My mother told me I brought you in this world. I'm going to take, take you out. out. That is not my mother's commitment to murder. That's a hyperbole. <laughs> right. That's a hyperbole. So he said, oh, so you were just playing. I said, no, my mama wasn't playing with me, and I ain't playing with y'all. So now let's talk about some reparations. <laughs> who exactly. who would have thought, thought our assemblyman <laughs> was the comedian? Exactly, right? <laughs> hey, listen, anything's possible. The president of the United States is a comedian. You know? He does it real who, well, you know? Who, who would have ever thought that? Um, uh, yeah, you know, um, what's crazy is that we really need this type of talk and it needs mm -hmm. to be understood because it's, it's fun. Like the reason me and uh, Jamel started this show was because for one was education mm -hmm. and, um, you know, us speaking out against, well, probably more me. I'm the, I'm the problem child. I'm the one who goes <laughs> out and say, you know, y'all this and y'all that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to have this talk and it needs to be really? said because, us as, as black people, I don't feel that we empower each other right. enough or, or, or give each other the courage to really right. stand up and be like, look, we got to stop this. Right. We, we shouldn't accept this. Right. You know what I'm saying? I, I was with you uh, a few weeks ago at the uh, a Kai Gurley um, rally protest. Right, 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 right. And, you know, the thing that set, upset me about that is that a Kai Gurley, he's from a big project, Pink Houses. Mm -hmm. There should have been more people out there. Mm -hmm. because us as black people, we tend to care only when it affect us directly. Mm -hmm. We don't even care when it affect our mm -hmm. neighbor anymore. Right. Let me just say something about that. Whenever you're involved in organizing, I usually stay away from saying that. And the reason is this. We're like, what we, since you said it, we, we'll just deal with it. <laughs> but, you know, it would have been better to say, man, y'all should have been there. We had a powerful rally. I don't care if it was two of us. Yeah. You know, like, give power to the people that show up. Don't yeah, yeah. give power to the people that ain't show up. Yeah, yeah, true. Like, ain't nothing that happened because you weren't there. True. You I, know, no. I always say, if you see me speak or if I talk about an action, you wouldn't know if it was a 1,000 people, like we had 60,000 at the reparations rally. Mm -hmm. I would come back saying the same thing if we had those 30 people at Wall Street at 3 o'clock when everybody was working. So... For me, I was happy to see it. You know, and I've been out here for 40 years in the struggle. Yeah. So whoever comes, I try never to say, you know, where, where are the people? Like, you know, like you have a meeting, and they say, uh, wow. You know, like say all four of us show up to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And they say, hey, where are the people at? What the hell do you think I am? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> so, you know, I'm sitting here, so I don't count. I get more attention if I don't show up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, but that's only you're not saying that. So that to say, I said that to say that, but you're right. You are right. Okay. You know, our people are not pissed off enough. Our people, and you're right, it, until it happens to them, then they want the whole world to stop. But what I always say, you missed it. Man, we had an awesome rally. We had 30 people in there. The guy didn't want to let us in. Yeah. And we got in. And we got upstairs to talk to the the um, commission 
the Commission on Judicial Conduct, what we achieved that day is that we got a chance to bring a complaint to the Judiciary Commission on, on Conduct against the judge. Because okay. that judge, man, can you imagine? First of all, Ken Thompson should be ashamed of himself, the DA, the black DA. Okay. We, you know, this case, the Kai Gurley case, you, you cannot fathom someone accidentally shooting somebody when they purposely took out their gun and pulled the trigger. Yeah. That this cannot be an accident. So I sat through the trial, and this guy, Officer Liang, mm -hmm. y'all know what vertical patrols are. Yeah, that's yeah. And it started the top floor of the public housing development. And a vertical patrol is a routine patrol. It's not somebody calling the police because something's happening on the stairwell. Yeah. It's a routine patrol. You go up to the top floor. I grew up in the projects. And, you know, when what we did on the staircase, nobody got beat up. Nothing. We did the doo-wop scene. We smoked herb. You know, you had the girlfriend on the stairs. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what y'all did. That's not what I did. <laughs> not, not we. That's what y'all did. You I, mean, know? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I wasn't in the staircase, but I was on Pebble Beach. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And for, people, and for people who don't know what Pebble Beach is, that's the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, when I was growing up in the Lillian Wald houses, and you're on the staircase, you have somebody looking out for the cop, you hear the jingling from their keys, hey, the man, come on, let's get out of here. Nobody got killed on the stairwell. They didn't even rob people. I mean, a lot of that stuff happened outside. Yeah, that's it didn't true. even happen on the stairwell. So the vertical patrol was just that. The cops go up, there's no need to take out your gun. And there was a police procedure that says, when you're doing vertical patrol, keep your gun holstered. If the stairwell is dark, you got a flashlight, man. Exactly. You take your flashlight out, and you don't have two rookies doing vertical patr patrol. patrol who are afraid of us in the pink houses. Oh, the pink houses, a lot of crime. Man, the pink houses, 80% of the people in the pink houses are beautiful people. Mm -hmm. Ain't doing nothing but trying to survive. And then you got two buildings at war with some little knuckleheads. You know, it's not what people think. You, know, you say that the pink houses, well, that's dangerous. No, the cops are more dangerous to us than I. If I saw police officers on one block, and if I saw a bunch of brothers pants down with however they were dressed, on this block at night, I'm going this way with the brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I would be more fearful going past the police at night than the brothers that's supposed to be all that. I don't mean that we're not having crime and all of that, because we do. Him, here's what he does. He sees a dimly lit hallway. The first thing he does is pull out his gun. Mm -hmm. That's wrong number one. Mm -hmm. Wrong number two, when you pull out the gun, they say, the police department, you're supposed to keep the shooting finger outside of the, outside the, barrel, of the, the trigger, trigger. Outside yeah. of the trigger, yeah. yeah. On the side. Yeah. He didn't do that. He put it on the trigger. Mm -hmm. Secondly, thirdly, he opens the door. If you hear something, you're supposed to look, listen, and then act. Police, who's there? They would have said, uh, us, officer, and that's it. He pulls out his gun, puts his hand on the trigger, opens the door, and they say you're supposed to go in sideways, not front, center, mass first. He goes in first, hears the and pulls the trigger. That's reckless. That's the reckless part. That's why he got charged with manslaughter. Manslaughter is reckless. Manslaughter, too, was recklessly. He recklessly caused the death of a person. But here's the key part that really makes it manslaughter and not what this judge did. He knocked it down to criminally negligent homicide. And the judge was, was Asian just like him. Asian judge, right? Yeah. So manslaughter means that you recklessly cause the person's life, but here's the second part of manslaughter, that you were aware and conscious that your actions could cause somebody to die. Mm. See, that's the important one. Y'all hold on to that So when I bring up criminally negligent homicide. So that's what he did. Melissa Butler, the sister who was with a Kai Gurley and was a key witness, like got helped get the conviction. She was in front of a Kai. So when they opened the door on the seventh floor, as soon as they opened it, she saw the dimly lit and she saw a herd of shot and saw a spark. She turned the corner to go down the stairs, and that's how 
Akai got hit. She could have gotten hit in the head because she was shorter. Wow. Hits Akai in the chest. Akai goes down two flights to the fifth floor, and he drops. <coughs> in a pool of blood and his urine, he's dying. Yeah. These two fools are still on the eighth floor saying, oh, my God, should I call it in? Looking, trying to save his behind. Mm -hmm. Looking for the spent shell. Wow. And should I call the supervisor? No, you call the supervisor. You call. A guy is dying yeah. on the fifth floor. Melissa knows nothing about CPR. They are trained CP, They're trained with CPR. Mm -hmm. They don't go down there. So Melissa goes into the fifth floor hallway, knocks on her neighbor's door. The neighbor comes out with her cell phone, calls up EMS. EMS says, tell his girlfriend to get some towels and put it on the wound and compress it. This is what Melissa's doing. They're still up on the eighth floor. Wow. Trying to call her and all of that. The EMS instructs Melissa on how to give him CPR. They finally come down, step over the body while Melissa's doing that and do nothing. She didn't even know, because it was dark, that they shot him. Wow. She thought those were the police who came from the call. Wow. So they stand in there, and at the trial, when Liang, the officer who shot a guy, they said, why didn't you give him CPR? I, I didn't know how to do it. He, well, says, he said something that he wasn't trained. He, he was trained. He said, I didn't remember my training, so I didn't know how to do it. Oh, wow. First of all, I think it's a lie. He didn't want to put his mouth on a black, black man. man. Yeah. That's what that really was. Right. Because there ain't nothing to it. And if you didn't know how to do it, you see she's getting instructions. Why don't you say, excuse me, man, we'll take him a man. Let the, let the EMS give you the instructions. Yeah. And you, at least you had some dummy that you was doing it with. She had nothing. She didn't know anything. That she could do it. You could do it. That was the negligent part. Yes. Right. See, that was negligent. So here you recklessly cause the death of somebody. You are aware that, how could you not be aware that shooting in the dark could cause somebody to die? You have to be aware of that. Right, and you know, I think, um, and I say this from time to time to people, right? My personal opinion with, uh, first of all, I know you know why Giuliani changed the requirement to college credits is to keep minorities off the job, to become police mm -hmm. officers. Okay, that's number one. And then number two, um, people talk about diversity. You want the police force, you want, you, know, you, you want these jobs to be diverse, but you gotta be careful because that could come back to shoot you in the foot, personally, th th mm -hmm. because you have people like Officer Liang and a whole bunch of other people who went to school or whatever, but if you can't naturally handle a job like police officer, then, in my opinion, you really shouldn't be doing that job. I mean, mm -hmm. even though you may, you know, you may fit the, you know, you may meet the requirements and you pass the training. Anybody could be trained to do anything, but naturally, do you have the knack of what it takes to be a real effective police officer? Now, that right there, basically, other race groups go into these pro housing projects in our neighborhoods, and they're scared. So that's why it was dark. He, he went right for his gun, you know, just like a lot of other police officers in the same situation. They do the same thing. And I see it for, my, and I see it for myself with regular traffic stops through the years out on the street. So, yeah, but, you know, and, I, then, and then, like, I've seen mm -hmm. female cops paired up together, and I've seen some cops that look like, I'm sorry, to, I don't want to sound like, I don't want to, sorry to say it, but I've seen some female cops that look like valley girls. They, they look like they're 150 pounds soaking wet. It don't matter. They got a gun on their Exactly, head. but they got a gun on their head. But even some males are like that. But see, I don't care about their fears. How many cops have we killed? How many cops have, you know, and, and there are some that lost their lives, but compared to the hundreds across the nation of us dying, if we're going to do the fear thing, then I'm going to go get me a, a gun and get licensed. And I'm going to say, look, I was walking by, and that police officer looked like he scared the hell out of me, so I had to do what I had to do. You can't kill people because you're fearful. If you're afraid of us, then damn it, go, go police in the white community where you're comfortable. Right. And then some of these brothers that get on, you know, you can't just do diversity, man, because a, a black cop killed little Nicholas Hayward in the Wyckoff Project's vertical patrol. Mm -hmm. Brother, black man. Opens up the door, stairwell, little Nicholas Hayward with a bright orange and yellow 
toy gun. They're playing cops and robbers. Which, which one? That was one from 1994 or something right, like that? Okay. Right, exactly. That. Yeah, Nicholas yeah. Hayward. I remember that. Yeah, you know, they have these bright yellow and orange toy guns. They're playing cops and robbers. And, and, and the brother, black man, killed a little black kid. Yeah. He walked, too. Asian guys shoot us. He walks. White guys shoot us all the time. They walk. 41 bullets wasn't enough for Amadou Diallo, mm -hmm. so they had to do 50 for Sean Bell. Mm -hmm. A stick-up, I wrecked them for Abner Louima. Mm -hmm. Man, they lucky we want to talk, much less, uh, 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 you know. Even remember um, <coughs> Timothy Stansberry. Timothy Stansberry. I was too. very much involved in that case at the Louis Armstrong house. Yeah, yeah. He was up. going up. He had his CDs. You know how we do. The uh, party was on the sixth floor in the other building. He lived on the sixth floor in the attached building. So rather than go downstairs, go across, and then go up, he just went up to the roof to cross over. As soon as he opened up the door, the officer shot him in his heart. Said he was startled. He thought he had a gun, some CDs. Yeah. See, my, my problem with that is, is that, uh, with the NYPD, is that they, you gotta be 21 years old to get the job. They hiring these guys from Long Island that don't know nothing about the urban community and don't know about our way of living. I'm from the Tompkins Projects, mm -hmm. and that's 16 floors. I lived on the 14th floor. My friend lived on the 13th floor. I was not going down exactly. to come back up. Exactly. I was crossing the roof. Exactly. So if somebody, if I was a cop on that, on that roof, first thing, statistics. How much crimes is really, how many people getting shot on uh -huh. the roof? <laughs> it's nothing. No. The most you'll find is, is somebody smoking up there, drinking. It's, Come on. It's quality of life crimes up there. Y'all remember that song? On the roof. With, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they sang a song. Up on the roof. Yeah, 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 you yeah, know? yeah. It was a, it was a long part of the culture. You know, we went up there and played and whatever. The only people dying in the hallways is us at the hands of police. Yeah. I don't know if a police officer ever got shot and no police officer ever was killed in the stairwell in the pink houses. So he had no basis for his fear. No, no police officer was ever killed on the stairwell in the Louis Armstrong houses. Mm -hmm. He has no basis for his fear on the, on the stairwell. We do. We have a basis for our fear. So don't run this fear stuff. Cause you know, you, listen. You could you could say it like okay. it is. You could say it like it is. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. This is progressive uh, action. Me, I am the assemblyman. <laughs> yes. uh, but don't run that fear stuff to us. You know, we don't want to hear that. If if you're so fearful, that's like saying, "I want to be a fireman, but I'm fearful of uh, flames. I'm fearful of smoke." Then <laughs> that's not the gig for you. If you're fearful of us, then you don't need to be policing. Exactly. And see, that's what, and, and that's my thing. You don't yeah, need to. I'm sorry to, I cut you off. Oh, I'm, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, so, you know, that's what I mean by say with diversity, where you shoot yourself in the foot. It's like, if you, sure, you may meet the requirements on paper and anybody could pass training, but if you feel in your heart that this is exactly. not for you, don't do it. Don't do it. See, and that's what made me so angry with D.A. Ken Thompson. Ken Thompson, we all supported him because Charles Hines was a horror show. Yeah. So we said, come on, Ken, you know, we'll get with you. He started off good. He said, Charles, you know, I'm going to come to East New York and other communities. You know how we have these open warrants yeah, yeah, on yeah. every little thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did a great job. He went. He with came the churches? In, yeah, he came in, right? He yeah, came yeah. in the churches and he said, look, bring your warrants in. He had a judge in the church mm -hmm. and he you know, got rid of these warrants. I said, that was good, Ken. The other good thing he did, a lot of black people were, you know, convicted wrongly, and he was, um, he, he got them out. He got them out, and he overturned them. There. And then he indicts Peter Luang, Liang for killing. I said, right on, we got an indictment. And then he convicts him for manslaughter in the second degree. But how the hell, after all of that, do you then say, no jail time. Well, do you think that it was a, a good thing at least that we finally got a conviction? No, hell no. Hell no. Let me tell you why. Because we got convictions before. We, You know, Abner Louima. Yeah, there was a conviction. Yeah. 30 years. The officer's doing 30 years and, and the sergeant is doing five years. Did five years. We've got convictions for you. See, we can't say... You know, isn't it good that at least Ken got the conviction? Hell no, man. You can't get a conviction 
for manslaughter, man. We ain't talking about no misdemeanor. This is a felony. Yeah. Manslaughter, and you say no jail time. What the hell good is the conviction if you're going to say the guy five years probation, six months house arrest, and five, 500 hours of uh, community service? I said, Ken, and I, I almost pleaded with him. I said, Ken, because he told me he was going to do it before he put it in. Okay. I said, Ken, don't do it, man. All your good is going to be wiped out. Don't you know this is the number one issue across the country? We got a black man in there. Damn it. You don't even have to recommend anything. See, that's what pissed me off. He didn't have to recommend anything. He could say, I did my part, like you said. Mm -hmm. I got the indictment, got the conviction. I have no recommendation. Let the judge do it. Put it on an Asian judge. Yeah. But this fool goes out there and says, no jail time. So, and he sat there, looked in the eyes of Akai Gurley's family, auntie, uh, sister uh, Peterson, and said, you're going to get justice. And then he says, no. So you know what that does? I'll tell you how that was more damaging than even giving them credit for the diet. This is not one of those things where you can say, well, at least we got that, at least we got this. This is a black life. If you can't be going across the country, black lives matter, black lives matter, and then a black man says it doesn't. Because you remember that young boy that kicked the cat? Oh, yeah, they were trying to hang him. And, Come on, man, they called him an the urban yeah. terrorist. Yes. Right, yeah. This is a, and I think he did some time. He, he did a few months or whatever for kicking a cat. And Michael Vick. Dogs. Dogs. Yeah. He did three years and because they was dogs died on his property. He didn't even kill a dog. Right. The dogs died on his property because he allowed some stuff to go down. Well, you know what that showed me? That animals' <laughs> lives is more important than, than black people's That's lives. what Ken Thompson is saying when yeah. he does that. Yeah. I, well, brought up, <clears throat> I brought up Michael Vick because I have a vivid memory of you. You were on, <laughs> you were on the show Like It Is. I used to watch that oh, show. Oh, yeah, with Gil. I used to with Gil. I used to watch that show every Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And you were on there. It was a conversation about comparing black lives to animals. So you talked about <laughs> right. how Michael Vick, right. the way you said Michael Vick got um, time for some dogs, yeah. you know. <laughs> so that's the reason I why said, I brought that up. You animal activists, don't call me up. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want the little doggies to die, but I'm just saying. You right. know what I mean? Dogs are dogs are dogs. We are human beings. So how could? And let me tell you something now. Those brothers in Ferguson. And in Baltimore, remember they yeah, rose yeah, up? Yeah. There's one brother that got on top of a police car, bashed the police car up. Do you know they gave him 12 years? What? For bashing up the police car. When the protest came up and too much pressure on them, they said, all right, he only has to do six months. But he went to jail for six months for beating up a police car. Wow. <laughs> you, you, remember, you remember my man... Plexico, what's the football? Plexico Burroughs. He, he, he shot himself in the chair. It got two years. <laughs> he got, he got yeah. 18 months for Shoot him shooting himself. himself. And, then, and then you have another brother in Baltimore. No, Ferguson brother. The Baltimore brother beat up the police guard. The Ferguson brother, they charged him with burglary for stealing the matches and arsons for burning down one of the stores. Wow. Right? Still in the matches is the burglary. Arson's burning down the store. Now, you're not supposed to burn down the store, but seven years? How oh. the hell does he get seven years? The man kicks the cat and gets some time. Michael Vick gets three years for dogs. Beat up a police car and you get some time. <laughs> but Ken Thompson says no time for killing a Kai girly. That's why, brother, we got to come down hard on Ken because we have to set an example. When we say no justice, no peace. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm uh -oh. glad you brought that, that, uh -oh. I'm you glad you brought spark, that up. You done sparked now, up to the now, settlement. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you something. I have a problem with no justice, no peace. Because mm -hmm. we don't keep our word. Right. And that's why we got to deliver on it. So what we've been doing with it, I've been trying to sell all kinds of wolf tickets I could. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what happens? When you're in this thing and it's the, your 50th case. And you done said everything that could have ever been said. I'm trying to say, come on, y'all, you know, yeah. rise up. But so they got, they got, but they get angry because of rhetoric. So in front of Ken Thompson's office, I said, um, 
you know, all right now, we've been peaceful, we packed the courts, we're doing everything that y'all tell us to do and still no jail time. You don't want us to bring Ferguson in New York. So they put that all over the papers. Mm -hmm. And I said, remember, when peaceful means for justice is denied, violence is inevitable, don't blame me, the social forecaster, just like <laughs> you don't blame the weatherman for the storm. They forecast. They forecast in the storm. You don't blame them for the storm. Mm -hmm. Don't blame me for the social explosion. I'm just saying. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying if you keep doing this and see, they think because we haven't done certain things. But let me tell you something, brothers, and y'all know this. Every time they kill us and get away with it, this is deeply embedded in our soul. Mm -hmm. It's there. It's there. Sometimes we implode, take stuff out on each other, mm -hmm. and at some time it's going to explode. They are not getting away with this stuff. You should hear the stuff in the hood. And you see, check this out, Little Ferguson. Ferguson's a town of 21,000 people. Mm -hmm. Michael Brown was killed, the brother. They've been killing us. Why was CNN in Ferguson? Why did the president mention Ferguson? Why did the Secretary General of the United Nations mention Ferguson? Because they tore it up. Mm -hmm. Capitalism don't want you messing with their property because mm -hmm. that's messing with their profits. Mm -hmm. They don't care if you kill each other. Don't mess with that property. New York had Sean Bell, all of that. Countless. We didn't, no president ever said, oh man, you know, come to New York and no CNN, no, none of that because we have peaceful demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Am I saying not to have peaceful demonstrations? I'm just saying. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have peaceful demonstrations. So when I just said, the police commissioner said in the New York Post, the Daily News, that the assemblyman better watch himself because we're gonna be watching him because he's coming close to committing a crime called inciting a riot. Right. Mm -hmm. So they asked me, I was on a TV program, what do you think about the police commissioner saying that about you? I said, I'm glad you asked. Tell the police commissioner to go straight to hell. <laughs> Take his killer cops and his, and his broken windows theory with him because if anything's gonna cause us to riot, it's gonna be him allowing his cops to kill us, kill us in this system that lets them get away with it. That's going to cause the riot, not my warning. Mm -hmm. My warning is not going to cause a riot. Right. You know what they said to Martin Luther King in 1967? For the same reason, police brutality, police killings in Watts, in Newark, in Harlem, all over America was in flames. They called it the riots yeah. of 1967. Yeah. They went to the Prince of Peace the man of nonviolence, and they said, Dr. King denounced the riots. He said, out of his mouth, I cannot denounce the riots without denouncing the conditions that caused them to riot in the first place. And he said, furthermore, and this was his famous quote, the riot is the voice of the unheard. You're not hearing us. Wow. So the, now the thing I have with the, with the demonstrations is – especially with, with Sharpton. We, somebody get killed in, in a black neighborhood, we marching in our neighborhood. We disrupt in our neighborhood. I believe all the energy should go to where that person who committed the crime, we should be at they, in their neighborhood. Absolutely. Disrupt in their neighborhood. Absolutely. And, and that's my big problem with, you know, we, we don't have to be violent, but we already know what's going on in our neighborhood. Let's go to their streets. Exactly. Let's, let's, even with Ferguson, the problem, I, it was, to me, it was beautiful to see people uprise like that. But when those fires simmered down, they didn't have no drugstores to get their grandmother medicine from because they destroyed their own community. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes you got to send a message. Anytime your enemy is upset at what you're doing, you're doing mm -hmm. something right. Yeah. Now, we don't own them stores in our community. How many stores do we own? And, yes, there are things that are harmful in our communities. But we don't own, what was it, CVS? What is the CVS. We don't own that. Yeah. There's no. some white boys on that and coming out to the neighborhoods. And I'm not saying we should burn it down. But I'm saying we're not burning down our stuff. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, if you don't do that, if you don't burn it down, let me tell you what happened in Ferguson because they burnt it down. 85% of the tickets given 
to people in Ferguson were given to black people so that they can boost the economy by having us pay tickets. After they burnt it down, they canceled all the tickets. Wow. In Ferguson, there were eight city council members, one Latino, no blacks. There are four black city council members now. Hmm. That didn't happen until they burnt the place down. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm, well, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Can't alter the truth. Yeah, that's what yeah. happened. I mean, that's you know, what happened. Sometimes you got to send that message. When that happens, every time, when, when, when the flames went up in 67, all kinds of poverty money and, all right, now we need to do something. You let something break in New York and see how much they capitulate. Now, I agree with you that there are certain leaders that I think are pimping us. I think they're hustling us. I think they hustle off just to get access to white power. Yes. See, they just want to have photo ops That's it. with the president. Yeah. And they want to be able to say, I led a march of 40,000 people. We went up, up Madison Avenue after Amadou Diallo. Okay. It was embarrassing. It was the most embarrassing march I've ever been involved in. We got on Madison Avenue, 40,000 people, Shopton in the unions, got on Madison Avenue. We even stopped for the damn light. How are you going to stop for the light in the supposed march? To keep, <laughs> supposed to keep at going. At least exactly. jaywalk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least jaywalk. I mean, come on, can we get a jaywalk going in? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We, we stopped for the light. The police said, holy. I said, what the hell? See, I like these latest marches when I went with some of these young people. We were no permits, no speeches. We were walking opposite against the traffic. The police said, go left. We went right. I mean, those, at least those say, no, you're not controlling us. And we're going to Officer Liang's house. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to his house to his neighbors. Some of the marches, some of the protesters went to Ken Thompson's house. Oh, yeah. Ken Thompson has uh, police in his whole block now. And he's upset, you know, how dare they do this to me. Well, my family can't sleep. How do you think a guy, girlie's family feels? How, much, how are they sleeping? Mm -hmm. Because you recommend no time for that. So he, and he's probably blaming it all on me. You know, they said, oh, Charles is doing all of this stuff. First of all, I ain't a punk. If I wanted to go to your house, I'd be there myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be there myself. Uh, matter of fact, I, would, might, I might go there after this show. <laughs> since, well, well, since, since it's 2 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, right. Like you, you won't be alone. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Got to get the clap on that one. <laughs> but that's what we mean by no justice, no peace. means that you cannot, doesn't, you don't have to always tear things down. It means that you're not going to live in peace as long as you're allowing us to be killed in a system that lets them go. Mm -hmm. Now, from what I understand, right, when, before the trial started, was it always an Asian judge or it started out as like, it started out as a white judge? Because mm -mm. from what I understand, <clears throat> the Asian community was in an uproar when they realized that, um, that, they, were gonna, that they charged uh, um, Officer Liang you know, yeah. when they indicted Officer Liang, the Asian community was in an uproar. So they basically wanted to have the judge removed or something like that. No, so it was always an Asian judge. It was always an Asian judge. It was judge. always an Asian judge, and it was a predominantly white jury. There was only one black on the jury. So it was an Asian judge, predominantly white jury. But the reason why he was convicted is because they, they brought the gun in to the jurors, and they told the jurors, make sure the gun was empty, each juror pulled the trigger. So when the officer's lawyer said it was an accident, the police firearm expert said you cannot fire that gun accidentally. It takes 11 pounds of pressure. Oh, that's 11 pounds? To, to, to pull, oh, to the, pull trigger. the trigger. Okay. Depending upon what so, type of gun. The right, hand exactly. Hand. So yeah. you, it takes, so the jurors pulled the trigger and they said, no, you can't accidentally pull this. You got to, Purposely yeah. do there, this. There's no star who could make that go off. Right, right. And and so that's why it was manslaughter and it was reckless. Ken told me, he said, Charles, this is the game they play with you. That's why you got to really be educated and up on this stuff. He said, Charles, do you really think Officer Liang intended to kill a Kai girly? I said, Ken, do I have stupid written on my forehead? 
<laughs> when you intentionally <coughs> kill mm-hmm. somebody, that's murder. Right. Basically, yeah. You didn't indict him for murder. Mm-hmm. You indicted, indicted him for recklessness, mm-hmm. manslaughter. He was reckless, Ken, and you were right. And you convicted him because he recklessly caused the death. How do you recklessly cause the death of someone and then you say he shouldn't get any jail time? I said, Ken, the next brother that gets busted for manslaughter, you better recommend five years probation. I want to see what's going to happen with the, uh, I don't know if you know about the case where the, the black cop kicked the guy in the head in bed style. Oh, he, yeah. He just got yeah. convicted. So it would be very interesting to see, see if he gets. what get, happens to him. Yeah, because yeah. he, he, he may get jail time. Look. You remember, <coughs> remember, I don't know if y'all remember the case with uh, Zongo, Osman Zongo, in uh, the Chelsea area. He oh, yeah, yeah, I, rem- that, yeah, I remember that. he went up in that warehouse. Yeah, I remember that. And they had it undercover because they thought that it was selling illegal s- DVDs and mm-hmm. stuff in the warehouse. A plane goes, officer was in a... Oh, 28th Street, I remember right, that. Yeah, I remember right, that. Right, it was that, on yeah. 28th Street. I remember that, yeah. The officer had a... A postal uniform on when Zongo came up the stairs toward the warehouse, and Zongo had nothing to do with the warehouse. The officer pulled out his gun, and Zongo didn't, he saw a mailman with a gun, so yeah. he went for it and shot him four times, mm-hmm. killed him. The jury was hung, so the judge took over the trial. Mm-hmm. He got manslaughter, was there in the second degree, and Criminally negligent homicide. The judge threw out the manslaughter and said, I'm going to give him criminally negligent homicide, five years probation, 500 hours for community service. This is what Ken Thompson tried to follow and the judge because of what happened in that case. First of all, criminally negligent homicide is when you negligently, and that's four and a half years, manslaughter is 15 at max. That's when you negligently cause somebody to die, but you were unaware, you had no idea, you failed to perceive that what you did could cause somebody to die. Like if I, if I took this microphone and just uh, playing around, threw it, threw it up against the wall and it came down and, and hit. Knocked me out, Tramel straight out. Knock, knocked you out and then you died. I never thought a, throwing a mic could kill you. But you would be in jail, trust right. me. Right, <laughs> but, that's, but that's negligent yeah. homicide. Yeah. When I have a gun, <laughs> I'm pointing at you and shoot, which is what a Kai Gurley cop did in Liang, that's not negligent. That's reckless. Yeah. And you know, I know if I close my eyes and start shooting, I know somebody could die. Yeah. And that's what made me so angry with Ken. How dare you not say he should do some jail time? At least that would send a message yeah. that the system. So, you know, so I still would call for revolution and change in this racist system if they would have given him 25 years to life because that would have just been one and the system stinks and needs to be changed. But no jail time? Yeah, that, that, was, kind of, that was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. You know, uh, Things need to be set up for us to uh, learn the law, uh, at least the basic laws of, mm-hmm. of, you know, how to interact with police. Just like, for an example, I had one a, a stop and frisk case mm. against the police um, by myself. They pulled me over in my car, um, broke my glove compartment, mm-hmm. and sped off. No wow. no badge number, no nothing. Just just um, description I had. I went to the precinct. Oh, we don't got no cops here that fit that description. All right, that's cool. I went down to the CCRB. I handled my business there. I was sending them letters and was like, yo, you know, this is wrong. I was, I was just staying up with the investigator. Year and a half later, they found the cops. Mm. And I said, well, what do I do now? They, they, they said, well, uh, I can't give you no legal advice. But it took me a while, look, about, about a few days to find a lawyer because he couldn't believe it. But, like, they don't substantiate officers of this are you sure like he's questioning my reading skills Mm -hmm. he said bring the paper down i brought the paper down he couldn't believe it my glove compartment was 700 dollars to fix um we Mm. we we sued them over a civil rights violation they gave me um seventeen thousand dollars look at that good for you but see look what you have to go through tell you the truth it was it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a lot that's why i wish i could just educate the brothers and be like look they're not supposed to do this 
Nope. There's a lawsuit waiting for you at the end of the road every time. That's right. That they do this to you. Mm-hmm. And, and and I mean, it, it, it's crazy. That's why I'm trying to set up yeah, something now. That's to, good for you. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I sometimes walk around East New York, and I know 75th know that oh, I do yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they love me in the 75th. Oh, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I walk around, and, you know, I, I love doing this because the brothers feel real good. Mm-hmm. And I roll up on cops. I said, officer, excuse me, you know, why did you stop that? I watched you. I saw you. What did you stop them for? Uh, they said, excuse me, uh, councilman, you know, don't interfere with me doing my duty. And I said, excuse me, officer, I am an officer of the city, too. And it is my duty to protect my constituents from you who's violating his constitutional right to move about freely. For you to stop somebody you have to have reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. For you to search him, you have to have probable cause. Mm -hmm. You have neither, because I watched the whole thing develop. You just told him to come over here, Mm -hmm. empty your pockets. You can't do that. You can't do that. And he said, well, I'm a law enforcer. And I said, and I'm a lawmaker. I make the laws that you enforce. Idiot, exactly. So right. You got to set them straight sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> he, he has to follow the law that you basically that make, that you make. <laughs> so, you know? I mean, yeah. Speak, speaking of laws, what's your relationship with um, Governor Cuomo? <laughs> <laughs> if you going to get into let's get, it now. Let's get into the good stuff. <laughs> Man, I can't stand. <laughs> you and me both. First of all, he's a bully. He's a racist. He's unintelligent. You know, when I first came up there, the media, everybody was saying a couple of things. When I first came up to the assembly, they said, oh, man, you know, Barron's coming up there. He's going to get Cuomo. He's going to get Shelly Silver, you know. And I let them know, I'm not coming up here to entertain you. You know, this is some serious, this is life and death stuff that we're going through. So, you know, the first thing that they was all talking about my dress. You're supposed to wear a shirt and tie. Okay. It's, it's the rules on the assembly floor. So the whole media was up there and said, are you going to put on a shirt and tie? Charles I said, absolutely not. They said, it's the rule. I said, I don't have to. I don't have to. I Let them try to tell me I can't sit in this chamber after my people elected me to come up here because you want me to, you know, dress like a white man? That's not happening. I said, no, your tie is all right, bro. I ain't talking about oh, no. I, I just want to let you know. I appreciate that. I, I think your brothers look handsome in shirt and ties. I ain't got <laughs> Just because you have a shirt and tie, don't mean that you're not conscious and all that. Yeah, I, I know. And you can we, wear we one understand. of these things and be unconscious. So. Oh, oh, all right. But I what, what is that? What, this is like, I, you know, I got this from my heroes were people like Kwame Nkrumah okay. and uh, Julius Nyeri from Tanzania, Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana, and um, Seiko Ture from Guinea. These brothers had these colorless suits, you know, and then, you know, the Indians and Asians and Africans, they don't wear shirts and ties, you know, yeah. they wear these kinds of suits. So I admired that in the 60s, we were trying to, you know, I have my African name is Shamari Baruti, which means forceful teacher. Okay. My brother gave me that, so at some point I'm gonna legally change it. But I, you know, I say Charles Barron, A.K.A. Shamari Baruti. So a lot of uh, the as a matter of fact, Tupac Shakur. I knew Tupac and Afeni. We'll talk about that. All right. Okay. In a bit, um, I wrote a nice piece for Afeni in the Amsterdam News. All right. But um. Tupac used to, he wrote me, he was 13, 14 years old, came over my house. It was before he went with Digital Underground yeah, and all yeah. that. Okay. He wrote a thing. He said, To Shamari, he called it Stormy Weather. I still have the his handwriting on it. But anyway, we, were, we wanted to take on some African identity. We were rejecting white culture, rejecting the white man's symbol of success. You know, I really want to come back one day and do a piece on our language, how we speak, why we speak the way we speak. Because see, what happened to African people here, and the reason why I reject the shirt and tie (coughs) is because I'm not letting a white man tell me what dressing for success is, what's proper dress. You know, because how are you going to have native, (laughs) thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) How are you going to have Native Americans in shirts and ties? Africans in shirts and ties, yeah. Asians in shirts and ties. Culturally, it don't. 
That made no sense. Yeah, no. So no. I, they said, why do you wear that? And I said, because I'm not white. <laughs> uh, <straight laughs> up, yeah. uh, I'm an African. It's African. No, okay. You were born in Africa? No, I was Africa, African born in America. Oh. So they told me that I wasn't going to be able to get in. Do you know when I got up there, the word went around, leave them alone. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how I got this on. Then they thought I was going to interrupt this uh, governor at his uh, first, his state of the state. Yeah. So my first year up there, because all the media was expecting it, the governor's people were expecting it, because I did it to him before, when there was 2,000 people at the Black Latino. Yeah, I read, I read about that. I yeah. read about that, yeah. <laughs> I, what I did, and people thought I planned it, but I really didn't. My wife was the state assembly person, and I went to the big gala, and I'm sitting there, and I, I was against the governor because he didn't want to do the tax in the rich. He didn't want to renew the millionaire's tax. So I said, man, I hope they don't let him speak. I didn't know they were going to let him speak. So honestly, it was spontaneous. I'm sitting at the table with my wife, and I'm looking at some Cornish hen, and then I'm looking at him. I can't be eating no chicken with this man up here <laughs> speaking. So I said, Inez, I'm getting out of here, but before I leave, I'm going to get the governor. So she said, fine. I said, but you don't do it because you got to stay with them up here. She said, no, I'm coming too. <laughs> so 2,000 people, and I wasn't planning it, so I went up toward the front, and I said, governor. It was embarrassing because he couldn't hear me. I oh, said, man. governor. I said, oh, shoot. So the, the security started coming. I said, oh, man. So I said, tax the rich. Tax the rich, tax the rich. So everybody starts saying, Tax the rich. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> look, look. I said, Phew. And they got something going. And he's so stupid. Instead of ignoring <laughs> me, instead of ignoring me, he says, I can't so see who it is, but I know it's you, Charles. <laughs> you know? I said, Oh, thank you. <laughs> he gave me a play. So it was because of that time that they, do, they thought I was going to do it when he did his State of the State address. I didn't do it the first year. It killed me to sit through there. I said, oh, my God. The next year, this year, nobody thought I was going to do it. That was in January, correct? Right. Yeah, all right. Right. Nobody thought I was going to do it. Because I believe I saw that video on Facebook when you did it this year. Right. Yeah. So this year, I said, oh, nobody thinks I'm going to do it. Nobody said, oh, Charles, is he going to get the governor? I thought I was cool. So I had to, this one I planned. I strategized. I said, <laughs> I got to get in the first five rows, you know, because he's right there. But they they usually sit the assembly in the back in the Senate in the first five. Yeah, yeah. So I got in the front of the line. They said, assembly in the back. I said, no, 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 no. Hey, hey, senators, y'all don't mind me sitting with y'all. <laughs> I said, oh, come on, y'all sit down. I said, Phew. So now I'm in the row. And I said, I got to pick the right time to get him because now this is a different crowd this is all his people yeah his hand-picked people yeah so i said i'm gonna find the right time so he said um and we did this working with the assembly and we all worked together so i jumped up not all of us governor you're a <laughs> hypocrite <laughs> he said he, he kept talking he said like that. I said, you're a hypocrite, Governor. Where's the $4 billion for the campaign for fiscal equity money? You owed us to black and brown children in New York City. Where's the money, Governor? We got a surplus. He said, all right, Assemblyman, all right. Everybody sees you. Now go take your seat. I ain't taking nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. so we stopped. That's how that went. Yeah. Now, the purpose of that not was just for me to get attention, but what happened, because I did that, Everywhere in the state, they were talking about campaign for fiscal equity money. That's the money that they owe black and brown children who were discriminated against in 2006. The court said they discriminated against black and brown children, and the state has to pay $6 billion. Wow. They paid, we still owed $5.8 billion, and they refused to pay it. So I'm saying, no, we can't sit here. He refused to pay that money, giving charter schools money and won't give our public school money. I'm not sitting here. And then he had the nerve. Remember he said he wanted the homeless off the street and yeah, tell yeah, the police? Yeah. He's the one who put them on the street. 
because he cut the Advantage program, which was $92 million, which gave rent subsidies for homeless people, assistance to the rent so they can find permanent housing. He cut it. He's the reason why they're in the streets. And then he wants the cops to take them off the streets because they might be cold. That's a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. So that's why I <coughs> disrupted him. And because I did that, I think it had something to do with the fact that he only wanted to give $266 million to our campaign for fiscal equity. I wanted a billion, and we got $625 million, three, three times as much as he wanted to give. Yeah. And a whole lot of other stuff we got because Carl Hasty, the first black um, – Speaker, speaker yeah. can now go in there and say, hey, you know, like, we're trying to keep jobs and everything cool, <laughs> but you got to give up a little little something more. So, you know, we've gotten something. Not what I want. Plenty more needs to be gotten. But this is him and de Blasio, the fake progressive, uh, the two worst leaders that we have uh, in this state. De Blasio is in East New York. We have the southern part of East New York is real affordable housing. Mm -hmm. He wants on the northern side, he's bringing in. 80% of the housing won't be able to, to be afforded by the people of East New York. That's when they was uh, picking it out there maybe like a Correct. few weeks ago, right? Correct. Yeah, I Correct. remember that. Because yeah. you know what they do, brothers? The, the, the AMI is what we got to pay attention to. That's the area median income. Okay. The area median income, they have one for every neighborhood. What does more than half the people make above and below? The area median income for East New York is $34,000 for a family of four. Wow. The area median income for the South Bronx is $24,000 for a family of four. Wow. The area median income for the Upper East Side is $111,000. Mm -hmm. So if a developer comes to you, <clears throat> you're the elected representative and say, guess what? I'm bringing in affordable housing. If you don't know nothing about the area median income, and you say, well, what's affordable? They're going to say 80% of the AMI is what the feds say is affordable. Okay. The AMI for New York City, hold on to this, y'all. The AMI for New York City is $86,000 because they include the metropolitan area, Westchester and Essex, you know. So it's 86000 So 80% of that is $64,000. That's what they're saying is affordable. So if a developer comes into my neighborhood and says, I'm building affordable housing, and I said affordable to who? He says, defined by HUD, that's 64000 I asked the guy, this is why I joined the city council. We have the power to pass the budget, not the mayor. Okay. We have the power to determine land use. Who's going to build land on, on city-owned land? If Donald Trump, with his old racist, ignorant, arrogant self, comes to my beloved East New York <laughs> and says he wants to build Trump Towers on Blake <clears throat> Avenue on city-owned property, mm -hmm. he has to come see the Black Panther. He has to come <laughs> see me because he doesn't have the power. Wow. It goes through what they call the ULA process, the Uniform Land Use Review process. It has to go to the city council. If the city council says no, it cannot be built. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of power. Oh, yeah. That so here I am sitting in that seat, and my wife is sitting in there now, and they have to come to me. So I don't have to put on no shirt and tie <laughs> for you. I don't have to. I talk the way I want to talk, mm -hmm. look the way I want to look. I put pictures up, Che Guevara and, and, and Brother Khalid Muhammad in my office, and I, ha I took out the American flag. I have the red, black, and green flag. Mm -hmm. And they sit in there, phony cell. Oh, that's a nice flag. I got a big picture of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. they, they need me. Yeah. So, so, so how do you feel about gentrification? Gentrification <coughs> is horrible. You know, just listen. They'll tell you what they're doing to you. Do you know what the word gentry means? Gentry means the elite, the mm -hmm. upper class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is really should be regentrification. They want communities back that they gave up. Remember, they didn't want, they didn't have Brownsville. Brownsville was all white. That's right. Prior to the sixties, East New York was all white. All white. Harlem was all, all of them. Flatbush. Flatbush, yeah. Right. Say they they saw that and then they said, you know what? Let's create <coughs> the suburbs. Let's get out of here. Let's get to the suburbs, Long Island. Let's get some big homes and white picket fences uh -huh. and let's. You know, move out there. 
and let's give the urban, the inner cities to these Negroes. Let's give it to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's pull the government service around. Let's burn our houses down and get the insurance mm -hmm. for the houses. And that's why East New York had all those burnt out lots. Which wow. is what was happening in the 70s, right? All the burnt yes. out buildings. Yeah. Yes, because they collect the insurance and got out of town. Then we come along, others, and we start building it back up. Look at East New York now. Mm -hmm. Y'all have to come and let me do a tour with your, of my beloved East we, we New York. Will, we would love it. I want to do it. that. And yeah. then y'all come back and report what you see. <laughs> but you, you'll see a lot of houses in the parks, like I was telling you, parks. So now we build it back up. Now they want to come back in. That's regentrification, the gentry class, the elite. They want to come back in. So what, the way they do it, and the new Jim Crowism is yes, it's mass incarceration, but it's also housing policy. Mm. What they'll do is make it so you can't afford to live in your own neighborhood. But where's all the black people going now? That, <laughs> South, Pennsylvania, Jersey, they're getting the hell out of New York because they can't afford to live here. I mean, just look at all our co-workers. Think about it. Yeah. Where do you hear a lot of our co-workers going? Atlanta? Getting houses. Yeah. You go to Atlanta, you can get a real nice house. Oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah. 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 They go into Atlanta, they leave, and, the, and this is to show you how effective my wife and I were in um, East New York. East New York is the only, and this is according to Daily News who can't stand me, that East New York it was the only black neighborhood that had an increase in population, 3.2% increase in the black population. Bed-Stuy lost 15% of its black population, had a 634% increase of the white population. Only 15%? It seemed like only 15% black people left. Left, right? <laughs> left, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what That's it seemed true. like there. But, you know, since when do you see white people at night with their little poodles, you know, and not afraid of nothing. And here you got the brothers with these pit bulls. And, but look at, look at Bed-Stuy. Look at Harlem. Look at Crown Heights. Look at Flatbush. I can talk about Harlem, yeah. Yeah. East New York had a 13.2. We had a zero increase in whites. Why? Because when they came into my office and they took out all of the pretty pictures of the housing, I told them, put it away. What's the AMI? He said, what are you talking about? I said, what is the area median income, the income requirement to get into these pretty houses that you're showing me? Mm -hmm. He said, it's 80% of the AMI. I said, well, this, and you're saying that's affordable for us? He said, yes, it's affordable. I said, do you know my neighborhood AMI? He said, no. I said, so how the hell can you be sitting here talking to me about affordable housing for my neighborhood and you don't even know the income of my neighborhood this meeting is terminated you go back and find that out and let's have a conversation when you come back i, I made him stay away for three weeks he came back he said oh, councilman i'm so sorry i said so what is it he said thirty four thousand dollars for family so is your project affordable he said no it's not so now talk real talk let's talk real talk wow i got where could you find a two-bedroom apartment? You're making twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars a year, forty thousand a year, and paying eight hundred and fifty dollars a month rent. I know some people to pay that for a room. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. So what happened to the middle class? Now here's the challenge, because I didn't do well with the middle class. <laughs> be honest with you. I, anybody making more than 50000 wasn't getting into anything that I was passing. Okay. So what I did, I went back and researched, and I looked at the income ban of East New York. And you, you asked an excellent question. I looked at the income ban, and I said, oh, okay, 25% are making 25000 or less. Then another 40% is making twenty five to 50000 but then there's another 10, 15 percent that's making 60, 80 thousand. Mm -hmm. So that's what I start doing. I said, you got to do 25 percent, 40, 15. Okay. So that I had a percentage in there now for those who are making 60 thousand. The two ends that I had to improve on, those who are making 15 and 20 thousand, they weren't in it. 
Okay. Because I started at 25 yeah. and 35, and those who were making 60 and 80,000 wasn't in it. Yeah. So my income band was like 25 to 50,000. Yeah. But ain't no white people coming in with that. <laughs> white people don't make that low income at all. So yeah. that's how I kept it black. Yeah. Right. But I needed to get, like you said, more of the black middle class. Because to be honest with you, you make sixty, seventy thousand dollars, you are in trouble. And when I say trouble, it's a nice salary, it seems like, but let them take the taxes out. You can't get no food stamps, you can't get no college, you can't get that's, no that's tab the, that's, in college. That's the, that's the position I'm in now. Right. You're stuck I'm, in the middle. I'm, I'm at a line <clears throat> where you know I make that money, but I don't bring home Exactly. That money. And then you can't get no loans like that. You can't get in none of these apartments because yeah. you make it. It's like you're not making enough not to need all of that stuff. And you're making too much to get it. To yeah. get it exactly. Yeah. So you ain't you ain't up there where you don't need it. So you're all right. And you ain't down there so that you can get it. You have a challenge. And that's why I look more at the housing now. I said we gotta take care of the 10, 15, 20% that's in that 60 to $80,000 I, gotta, I have bracket. to stop by your office. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, y'all got to come. I'm going <clears throat> yeah. to take you on a tour and I'm going to let you see what black radical politics can do. Because okay. we transformed first the political landscape of East New York. Our biggest problem wasn't the white boy. It was the black neo-colonial puppets of the Democratic Party. We, they wanted to stop us because they know I'm independent. And even some of the unions, you know, don't like me because they'll go with more yes, go along, get along people. Even though I, I got some good support uh, from TWU, particularly when Which Tucson were, oh, was there. No, no, no. I'm about to say, not, not the new administration. No, 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 no not this Tucson, administration. No. Tucson was yeah. there. You know, I got a lot of support there. After that, they supported some of my opponents. And sometimes they'll, they'll support me when it's nobody really running against yeah, yeah. me. Like... This time, everybody's going to support me because I'm going to win. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to beat me. That's when they all come on board. But when it was really trying, you know, sometimes 1199 was there, sometimes they weren't. And 32BJ, yes, this time, no, that time, depending upon who. So for me, we built a movement called Operation Power. Uh, when we leave, I want to go to my car and give you all a newspaper. Please do. The, please do. Uh, oh, yes. Operation Power, I want you to see that. We changed the political landscape, and we used the Democratic Party and registration as a means because 80 90% of our people are Democrats. So if you're going to run in the Democratic primary, you, 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 know, you, you, you win the Democratic primary, you're shooing for the general. Right. You don't even have to run. Oh. You, can go, you can stay home. Right. Because our people blindly vote Democratic. So that's why we use that. And we changed that. We got the city council seat. We got the state assembly seat. We got the two district leaders, male and female. We got the judicial delegates. We got the community board, five members, all operation power. Not a Democratic political club, but operation power. And we push black radical politics. We see this as a means, not an end, that the system has to radically change. Because you know what we're organizing around, really, is symptomology. What is that exactly? The symptoms are poverty, homelessness, mm -hmm. mass incarceration, unemployment, inadequate health care, miseducation. Those are symptoms of what? What creates that? A racist capitalist system where the 1% is in control of everything. So if, you're, if we keep saying stop police brutality, and you got to do that. We need workforce development programs because we're unemployed. Got to do that. Stop the mass incarceration. It's like, it's like this. It's like this is where all the symptoms are. You know, you have a machine over here producing all of that producing unemployment, producing. This machine is producing it. And you're over here dealing with what this machine is producing. Mm -hmm. It's constantly producing welfare, uh, unemployment, and producing all of this stuff. We're over here. Yeah. We're over here organizing around that. Nobody's touching the machine. So at some point, we got to stop this machine, capitalism. 
greedy, racist, monopoly capitalism controlled by white males mm -hmm. predominantly. Right. That's what our problem is. So in the Black Panther Party, while we were feeding breakfast and survival programs, we said pending the revolution because mm -hmm. we were moving more towards socialism and African communalism. The only system we know is capitalism. We don't know that in Africa they had a form of communalism. You know, can you imagine? Most of us can't even imagine a wageless, classless, stateless society. And a lot of the African communal society, it was more on the collective than the individual. Okay. So, like, if you were a hunter, you didn't get paid a salary to go hunt and get the food. That was your contribution to the community. Yeah. Brother here, he, he was a house builder. He knew how to build houses. Yeah. He didn't get a salary to build houses. Mm -hmm. That's what he built for the community. He was good at clothing for us. He knew how to hook up the clothing. So all of that was contributed. So you ate the hunter's food and you built the hunter's house and wore the clothing. That was a form of communalism. You know, it's more sophisticated now, but that's basically the difference between socialism, African communalism, communism, and slavery, mercantilism, feudalism, and capitalism. Those were those European exploitative systems. We got to change this capitalist system. Yeah, I, oh, I, yeah. I totally agree. No, definitely. Now, I have a question, right? Um, besides Governor Cuomo signing the $15 minimum wage and parental leave packages into law, Tier 6 left such a bad taste in my mouth mm -hmm. that I'm very disgusted with it, mm -hmm. especially, being a dem for, especially for him being a Democrat. Um, and I personally feel that it was unnecessary because if the state needed money or had a deficit, that wouldn't close the hole right away. First of all, the state didn't have a deficit. It had a surplus of $3.1 billion. It was a surplus. A surplus. He wasn't even closing no deficit. Secondly, he did not lead the charge on the $15. He's a Johnny-come-lately that took credit for it. Yeah, I, I figured that. Yeah, he was a Johnny-come-lately. Yeah. It was the state assembly that really was pushing the $15 and some unions was pushing the $15. He's a Johnny-come-lately to the paid family leave and the $15. The tier money, you know what they're doing with pension and health care? They having you pay more into the pension, the pension, pension. Mm -hmm. getting less out of it and taking longer to get it. They're, taking, they're having you pay more into health care. You know, the, the so-called Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, if I were in Congress, I would have voted against that. I would have been against the president because when he first came in, he was leaning more toward the socialism, but then they made him feel like that was a cuss word. Isn't, yeah. it, isn't, it, interesting, <laughs> isn't it interesting how Obama had to almost deny he was a socialist, or well, he did, when he was leaning more toward that because he was black and socialism was a cuss word. I remember when being a liberal was a cuss word. Here comes a white boy, Bernie Sanders. Proclaim socialist. <laughs> Proclaim. I'm a democratic socialist <laughs> and getting millions of votes, running a credible race. But Obama was saying, I'm not a socialist, y'all. He had to deny it. But anyway, the first thing we wanted was a single-payer health care system. Single-payer health care system. We got to still push for that. I went to Cuba. Health care is free. I just had that talk a few hours yeah. ago. I went to Venezuela under Hugo Chavez. Health care is free. We got the worst health care in, in the world. 26th, 28th, 9th, something like that. Yeah. Canada, free. England, they have a national. See, what Obama did... When he couldn't get the single payer, that meant Medicare for all. That meant that they were going to raise a little tax on the rich and provide $1.1 trillion so that everybody would be on Medicare. Health care would be free. There wouldn't be no co-payments and deductibles and all of that. I thought I had me some health care. I went to the doctor for something. See, yeah, I'm an assemblyman. <laughs> they said, thanks for the $50. Now, here, you owe us 30, another 1000 
You got to pay co-payments, yeah. deductibles, doesn't even cover everything. And the <clears throat> insurance companies, the private insurance companies, were laughing their way to the bank because they said all of the health care in, it's in state exchanges, but it's all private health care insurance. That's capitalism. Yeah. Socialism is when the state provides the health care. And why can't the richest country that the planet Earth has ever known, why can't it provide free health care for its people? This is a $4 trillion national budget, $156 billion state budget, okay. an $83 billion city budget. New York City's budget is larger than 47 state budgets in the United States. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that budget, you know. I wanted to talk, I wanted to talk exactly. Um, is it possible you could shed some light on the solvency of the state's budget exactly? And how does the state controller, controller keep New York State solvent? The state controller basically monitors the budget. The state assembly passes the budget. And the governor, executive branch, proposes the budget. Mm. The governor has no power to pass the budget. He has all the power to spend the money. Wow. So we're sandwiched. Let me, let me show you something real quick. This is why the city council is so important. The city council is a unicameral body. It's just one. 51 members. When I was there, 27 people of color, 24 whites. We were the majority. Could you believe that? Wow. We were the majority, 14 blacks, 11 Latinos, 2 Asians. Now we lost one black to a Jewish, white Jewish person in Harlem. Okay. Of all places. <laughs> Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> Harlem. Harlem. Okay. It's 26 and 25 now. The power of the city council is pass laws, determine what land use is going to be built on land, oversight over city agencies. This is the power of the city council. And they pass the budget. They passed the budget. Yeah. If, if the black, Latinos, and Asians had any part of the anatomy that was, you know, strong, they could get up and say, we are not giving you our 26 majority votes until A, B, C, D is in that $83 billion budget. That's what I was wondering, why that... Why that doesn't Whoa, that? that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> we got to get black, radical, conscious, bold, strong, audacious people in the electoral arena. That See, most good. of those people don't want no part of it. If they're black revolutionaries like my friends, some of them say, hey, man, I ain't getting involved in that system. That's a two-party system. That's a white boy system. If there's other apathetic people, man, voting don't mean nothing, man. So you know what happens? All the sellout Negroes get the job. <laughs> they're the ones that are running. And they're the ones that the Democratic Party manipulates. So they don't even realize their own power. You know how uh, one of our writers said that we are so backward sometime, if there's no back door for us to leave, we'll make one, Carter G. Woodson. <laughs> We'll make one. We'll carve out a back door <laughs> if it doesn't exist so that we can go through the back door. Yeah. Harriet Tubman said, I could have freed more of you if we'd have just known you were slaves. Yeah, yeah, that's, you yeah, know, that's true. And yeah. th but that's the mentality. See, the people that union leaders and county leaders put in office are the ones they could control. Yeah. If they can't control you, they don't want you. That's why they don't like me. They know I'm right. They know I'm making sense. Well, God bless they them. Know. <laughs> <laughs> they know I'm right, but that, I'm not controllable. Yeah, but why? Why exactly did you vote against Tier Six? Right. Because I don't think that we should be putting more money uh, into those pensions and more money into the health care. The workers should be putting less money in and getting more out of it. The higher up you go in tiers the more money you have to put in and the less you're getting out. And they're changing the age for that. I think that we should go back. My wife has been blessed to be in tier one and two 
when she was in the education system. Oh, yeah. And she got a sweet pension. Yeah, you know? She didn't pay into it. Right. Stronger <laughs> tributary, yeah. Talk she to me. <laughs> Talk to me. Me- meanwhile, I'm on the other end of that spectrum paying 6% Ridiculous. to get the same pension that he's going to get. Ridiculous. I'm tier four. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Right. See, the, and that's because gr- the greed of capitalism, that's not necessary. Do you know what they're doing with your pension money? Please tell me. <laughs> they invest in your pension money all over the place, all Israel, all over the world. Your pension money, that's why these comptrollers, they ain't just writing checks and monitors. They invest the pension money. Billions. Of course. Billions of dollars your pension money. And if they make bad investments, <laughs> your pension's in trouble. Yeah. You know, if the market crashes, that's why they have to regulate things, you know. Part of the problem in capitalism is like if you have an unregulated market and they start investing your money into high-risk investments, then, you know, the 401Ks and all of that stuff is in trouble. None of your stuff is guaranteed. Your savings account in the bank ain't even guaranteed anymore Mm. because anything can happen in this market capitalist economy when they invest your money with no regulations. You remember, you hear Bernie Sanders, it sounds like a broken record, but he's making sense. You know, break up the big banks. Break up the big banks. Too, they, they, they were too big to fail. So Obama had to bail them out to the tune of $800 billion, the biggest welfare check in the history of the world. <laughs> $800 billion. And before Obama, Bush had already given them seven, $800 billion. Wow. So, and they said they're too big to fail. Well, damn it, why don't you have regulations that say you cannot be that big as a bank? That you cannot be that big. You know, you can regulate it. But even a regulated capitalist system, because there once was some regulations, we still catch hell. We still have poverty. Mm-hmm. You tax the rich, we still catch hell. You regulate Wall Street, we still catching up because we're black and this is racist. We're at the bottom. All these immigrants can come in at the turn of the century, start on the bottom. Yes, they were discriminated against, Irish, Polish, Italian, and all of that, Jews, Germans. But because they were white, they came in at the bottom where we were and shot up the economic ladder while we stayed at the bottom. Yeah. And the indigenous people stayed on the reservations. They got a lot of nerve. You know, They said that capitalism was started by Adam Smith. He was an economist, a white economist. He was supposed to be such a genius. What genius? (laughs) You steal land from the indigenous people, Mm -hmm. then steal us to work it. (laughs) They take no genius. Where is that guy from? Is he a European? I think. Yep, he's from Europe. Them, them, them Europeans like they. The way they think, everything revolves around them. Even when you look at the prime meridian, (laughs) the prime meridian goes straight down Europe. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. But you know what's interesting? Look how they do history. They got us so confused. Y'all remember Paul Revere, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. He had the, what did mm-hmm. you say? The British were coming. Yeah, yeah. What the hell do you think he was? He was British. Mm. The British weren't coming. They were already here. <laughs> <laughs> he was British. Remember the 13 colonies? Yeah. Sorry. They were from Britain. And they were <coughs> colonies of the king because they had a mercantilism system. That was a colonial system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember the sun never set on the British Empire because mm-hmm. it had colonies all over the place. Now it's a little mud pat in the, you know, Europe because they lost a lot of their yeah. colonies because of revolutions. Yeah. But the 13 colonies were from Britain. The reason why they had the Revolutionary War in 1776 is because They said the king was too oppressive. They didn't like his rules. And you know what the thing they were fearful of most? What's that? Britain was abolishing (laughs) slavery. The 13 colonies in 1776, oh, hell no. We want our slaves. Mm -hmm. Britain, y'all abolishing slavery? We need to be independent from you so we can keep our slaves. Yeah. Slavery built America. Without a doubt. Built America, so that's why they had the Revolutionary War. And you know what? A hundred years later, didn't they have a civil war Mm -hmm. over what? Slavery. Mm -hmm. You know what happened? The slave states, there was about 20 some odd states, 11 slave states, 11 free states. So the slave states left 
and said, we're going to form the Confederacy. Remember? Yeah, that's, that's where the flag came apart. The Confederate flag. Yeah. Jefferson Davis was their pre president. Here's, here's why Abraham Lincoln never freed. The two biggest lies in America is Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and Christopher Columbus discovered America. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the two <laughs> biggest lies biggest. in America. You can't discover a place where people already exist. Basically, basically. And what Lincoln did, if you go to the Internet and take up the Emancipation Proclamation, it will read that all those slaves in the rebellious states are free. The states, the slave states that did not leave the Union, there's about four of them, mm -hmm. you could keep your slaves because you didn't leave. <coughs> wow. So the, the slaves that enslaved Africans, because we're not slaves, we're enslaved. Yeah. In, the enslaved Africans that left with the slave states, he didn't have jurisdiction over them. They left. Wow. Jefferson Davis, the Confederacy, mm -hmm. they had their own thing. So he couldn't free them because they left. The ones that he could have freed, the four slave states that stayed, he said, you don't have to, you don't have to give up yours because you stayed. Wow. Lincoln didn't free anybody. He didn't free anybody. And if he did, the Emancipation Proclamation was proclaimed in 1863, January 1st, 1863. The Civil War ended two years later in 1865. Mm -hmm. If he freed <coughs> us, why did you have to have the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery? True. The 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865, 68. If he freed us, you don't need a 13th Amendment. That's true. You had to have that because he didn't free anybody. You know who freed the enslaved Africans? Who's that? The African soldiers. 200,000 of the blacks joined, they call them the colored okay. infantry. They joined the Union Army because they said either I'm a slave or I'm a fight with the Union. They gave the muskets. They went from plantation to plantation, liberating their people. And they would never tell that story no, in school. No. <laughs> My first time hearing it, honestly. Listen, they went from plantation. Y'all heard of uh, Juneteenth? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know what Juneteenth right. is. Now, Juneteenth, it wasn't like, oh, they didn't know. Remember they said that Africans in Texas didn't realize? <laughs> that they was, yeah. they, they didn't realize. Bull, bull. bull. They, didn't, they were not free because the African soldiers didn't get to them yet. Mm. They were going from plantation to plantation, freeing. And after they finally got to Texas, it was like two years later. So when they got there, they freed them too. They knew that the soldiers were doing the freedom, wasn't emancipation. And just check. Just think of this on the white side. Not all whites owned slaves. Mm -hmm. There was some poor white folks. <clears throat> Because capitalism has a class to it system, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Without definitely. A doubt. It's race and class. Mm -hmm. 60s, we used to argue, race, first class, mm -hmm. you know, socialism, first black nationalism, whatever. But the whites said, whoa, you abolished slavery? Who's going to pick the cotton? Who's going to take care of the kids? Mm -hmm. Who's going to do all the dirty work? And then the whites that didn't have... Slaves, they were saying, wait a minute. These blacks are doing better than we are after slavery. Remember Black Wall Street? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Tulsa? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember Rosewood? Yeah. Y'all remember also Wilmington in 1898? These were flourishing black communities. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I watched said, a documentary on hey, Black Wall Street. Segregation was a good thing. <laughs> integration it, it, was, it, it, it was a great thing. Integra integration hurt. It hurt everything. Mm -hmm. Listen. Those towns were flourishing. Yes, sir. And if you read the history of Tulsa, read the history of Wormswood, and read the history of Wilmington, mm -hmm. when the whites realized how well we were doing after slavery, they got pissed. Mm -hmm. The KKK rose up. Mm -hmm. 1877, the Rutherford B. compromise. They said, you know what? Republicans... The Republicans were the radical Republicans were for the blacks. Both of them were racist. 
But the Democrats were more racist. Wow. They didn't even want the black vote and none of that stuff. The Republicans, the party of Fred Douglas, the party of Lincoln, they were the ones initially that said, you know, we're going to give, you know what the 15th Amendment was? Gave the right to vote, right? Mm -hmm. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. Right. Right? The 15th Amendment gave the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the fourteenth amendment gave citizens right. Okay. But just think of this: the fifteenth amendment gave who the right to vote. Remember, white women didn't get the right vote to nineteen twenty, twenty one. The suffrage movement. Yeah. The white man is so vicious. He gave black men the right to vote over his woman, so that the black men can get with the white men and take over the South. Wow. That was a political scheme. So black men had the right to vote before white women in a racist cracker country. <laughs> you know? <laughs> just just think of that. Just think of the mentality of this man. And 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 and, and, and it prevails in the present day because Basically, this country put a black man in office before they put a white woman in office exactly. back in 2008. Right. And, right. I let, and I right. let people know that all the time. Right. You know, why would you do that? And, and a white woman was running against them, a Clinton. Mm -hmm. Well, who do you think will win this one? Well, I think we're in big trouble. There's no win on a national level unless we really build a strong movement. Bad news. Hillary Clinton's going to win, but the bad news, Donald Trump has a shot because <laughs> people... People don't wake up. What yeah. I tell you? <laughs> what I tell you? They better wake up because there's a lot going on that people are going to be surprised at. But we lose either way because we got Negroes rushing us to Clinton. Right. Clinton is a conservative Democrat. <coughs> Bernie Sanders is making us sound progressive mm -hmm. because of his power of his movement. Remember when the Clintons were in office with a Republican Congress? Mm -hmm. That was with Bill. Mm -hmm. Welfare, we're going to change it as you know it. Welfare went from a five, a, an entitlement program. As long as you demonstrated a need, you got it. Mm -hmm. He took money out of welfare, put it in the military industrial complex, mm -hmm. and said, you're off in five years whether you demonstrate a need or not. Mm -hmm. Bill Clinton. Yes. Affirmative action, Bill. Don't end it, mend it, you know. Mm -hmm. Roll back the hands of time on affirmative action. Three strikes and you're in for life. Mm -hmm. Crime bill. It's a crime bill. Yeah. Mass, that produced a mass incarceration and built the, mil the prison industrial complex. Yeah. Bill Clinton. Yeah. Free trade instead of fair trade. Anytime they say free, you're paying. You're going to pay big time. Yeah. You know what free trade means? That was NAFTA what he did. With NAFTA. That. There you go, yeah. brother. Mm -hmm. NAFTA, CAFTA, GATT. All of those were free trade agreements. That <laughs> means corporations, you can uproot yourself from America. And go overseas. Go overseas and get that cheap labor. And we won't even tax your goods when they come back mm -hmm. so that you don't have to worry about minimizing your profits. You can maximize your profits. Mm -hmm. Free trade is a conservative right-wing notion. Mm -hmm. Clinton gave us that. So if Hillary wins, the Republican Congress and Hillary, part two. Exactly. They're going to be working yeah, part yeah, yeah. two. Yeah, other. And I tell people that, you know, because basically she's a Wall Street, you know, you know, her history going back. She was a bar oh, she was on, a, gold, a Goldwater girl. She's and horrible. She, she's, yeah, of course. Yeah. Look she, what she said. She, she help plan the killing of Muammar Gaddafi mm -hmm. in Libya. Mm -hmm. That's an African leader. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they painted him up like some monster. Muammar Gaddafi was talking about the United States of Africa. Mm -hmm. Muammar Gaddafi was building a water facility in mm -hmm. Africa like it has never had before. The biggest problem in Africa is drought. Yeah. Muammar Gaddafi said to African countries, hey, y'all, I took over... You know, my African nation, we got all the oil. Y'all don't have to borrow nothing from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank. By borrowing from them, they impose free trade on you and all of that. Borrow from me. I, I'm putting billions of dollars in a Central African bank, and you can borrow from me interest-free loans. Yeah. 
The worst thing he did and said, guess what, y'all? Let's not deal with the dollar anymore. Let's not deal with the pound anymore. Let's not deal with the euro anymore. Currency is mm -hmm. deep. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a gold currency for Africa, and we're not dealing with their dollars no more. That's a dead man. <laughs> you mess with their currency, yeah, yeah. the dollar bill, mm -hmm. that's when they said regime change. Now, even some of the Republicans, like Donald Trump, said Hillary shouldn't have killed Gaddafi. Not that he loved Gaddafi, but he said, you know, the Republicans said he may be a monster, but he's our monster, mm -hmm. you know, because they knew that as long as Gaddafi was there and Saddam Hussein was there in Iraq, these are guys they didn't like and all of that, called them everything, but they knew below them was ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Mm. And as soon as they took out Gaddafi, Al-Qaeda, ISIS and all of that, and what happens to the ambassador? He's killed. No ambassador ever died under Gaddafi. But this, he, they destabilized Libya, they destabilized Iraq. They're trying to get to Iran. They're trying to get to Syria, all to protect Israel, yeah. the little white settler nation that's oppressing the Palestinian people. You know, I was telling some of these people, I said, listen, look what Obama and Hillary Clinton did in the Middle East. They're always claiming that Israel has a right to defend itself. You know them little rockets that they shooting at them don't even reach Israel proper? <laughs> and they got this defense, that defense yeah, yeah, the, yeah. thing that the United States built for them to intercept them in things. Intercept the missiles. Right. right. Look at the statistics in the last war between, and I went to the Gaza Strip. It was like a whew, blown out place. 2,130 some odd Palestinians killed. 500 of them were children. Wow. Babies, children. Hundreds were women, innocent. 85% of them were civilians. 67 Israelis were killed. 64 of them were soldiers that went into Gaza and got their butts whipped. Mm. How the hell does the world sit around and let Israel kill 500 babies? Nobody says nothing, and, and Barack gives them more weapons to kill more. And if you ever wanted to do a program on Israel and go through the history, think of the Balfour Declaration, the Zionist movement that started in 1890-something, where Balfour, uh, Lord Balfour said, take Palestine and the Zionist movement with, you know, Brownsville? Yes. Yeah. You ever heard of Herzl Street? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Theodore Herzl. Zionist. Herzl Street is named after the father of Zionism because Brownsville was hooked up by Charles Brown, who was a white man. You know, we'd be saying Brownsville, yeah. white man, Harlem, Dutch, mm. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, That's Dutch. Right. Dutch mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We'd be claiming all of these names like. Like this like is we, a black like flag, ours, yeah. right? Know? But that comes from not knowing history, <laughs> right? Right? You know, <laughs> the Brooklyn in the house. I mean, I guess that saying go that it ain't where you from, it's where you at. It's where you at. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So all of that, you know, is is white male supremacy, imperialism, colonialism. Mm -hmm. We gotta learn this stuff. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. even when we fighting for jobs and all of that stuff, in the meantime, you better get the bigger picture. Yeah. So that you know what's happening, you know, all in the world. East New York, I do a whole piece on the history of East New York. 1619, the Dutch came to East New York. You heard of Bobby Street? Barbara, yes. Slaveholder. Yeah, Skank Avenue. Skank, yeah. Biggest slaveholder in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mr. Skank. How about Van Sicklin? Van Sicklin, yeah. Slaveholder. Wow. You know, <laughs> this and show then when is going to be crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this show is going to be crazy. Oh, yeah. I, lo I love it. I, I mean, that's the deal. And the real deal is that I told brothers and sisters in East New York, I said, listen, who are these African people that built East New York? You know, the, every, all of them Dutch, they were in the, uh, the west side, and they were in Flatbush and Brownsville. You heard of New Lots? New yeah. Lots, of Avenue? course. Yep. You know what that was named after? Because everything in East New York was forest. And they were in 
Brownsville and they were in East Flatbush over there. So they went east, made the Africans build a road so they can find new lots because they were living on the old lots in Brownsville. Wow. wow. So they went to new, new lots. lots. And that's where that came and from. And that's where that came <laughs> and from. And you know what, J- Jamel grew up right around the corner from here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know where the name Brooklyn came from? You remember the <coughs> Brookline House? Brookline yeah, yeah. Projects over there, yeah. Look, you know the real name? But it's not really Brookline. That's what we black people Yeah, that's what black the, people call it, yeah. It's Brookellen. Mm-hmm. Brookellen. You yeah. see how it's spelled? Right, B-R-E-U-K-E-L-E-N. Right, right, yeah. right. Dutch. Dutch, that's the Dutch name. And then after the Dutch first came here, remember they named New York New Amsterdam? Yeah. Right. That was the Dutch, 1625. 1664, the English beat up the Dutch and named it New York because of the Duke of York. Wow. Peter Stuyvesant, (coughs) little punk slave master, Peter Stuyvesant, was the governor of New Amsterdam. When the English said that they're going to take it, he said, oh, no, we're going to fight. He got his butt whipped and blamed us. He said the reason why he lost, because he had to feed his 200 slaves. If he didn't have to feed them, I would have beat you all. Wow. <laughs> Peter Stuyvesant's a racist, but we have Stuyvesant High School. Stuyvesant High School, yeah. I couldn't name the park after Sonny Carson. Remember when that battle yeah, on yeah, Sunny yeah. Carson yeah. Park? I wanted to change Lyndon to yeah, Sunny yeah. Carson. Oh, he's a racist. Right. Well, what the hell do you think Skank is? Well, all of them was. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> all of them, yeah. Well, 72 names of streets in Brooklyn are named after slaveholders. Wow. Mm-hmm. The, first, <laughs> the, the first 14 presidents of the United States owned slaves. Enslaved Africans. When I called Thomas Jefferson a slaveholding pedophile, they had a fit. It was the truth. He raped Sally Hemings, a 14-year-old African girl on his Monticello plantation. He took her virginity, had babies. He's a pedophile, a slaveholding pedophile. Tom, George Washington sold us for molasses because he owned slaves. George Washington came to New York looking for his slaves. Wow. And you know, when they first decided to abolish slavery, the debate started in the 1700s. That's when they built the first state penitentiaries. At the same time that they were abolishing slavery. Check, we went from the plantation to the penitentiary Mm -hmm. because they still needed our labor. We Uh were here for uh labor. uh uh And that's why they had the black codes back then and they have the quality of life crimes now. Exactly. (laughs) And another thing is I can remember when they wanted to rename the Queensboro Bridge to the Ed Koch Bridge, oh, wow. you were, you were in an uproar. I can remember seeing the video on that. I was like, wow, look at Barrett. You I know? said, Koch? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but see, name, names mean a lot. Names mean a lot. You know, when y'all come out to East New York, I'm going to show you all the burial ground. You know where that library is, New Lots Library? New Lots and where? Which one? It's on New Lots between Barbie and Skank. Barbie and Skank, okay. Yeah. Did you see that next to that church and you see the cemetery? Yes. That's, when I take you out there, you're going to see the headstone of Skank and Van Sicklin. Oh, really? Because you know what they did? In 1854, they wanted to build a school for the white Dutch slaveholders. They built PS72 where that library is. Okay. That was a burial ground. Wow. The, the whites were up toward New Lots, and they were segregated. The blacks were back toward Livonia. Livonia, okay. Right? They took the whites out, reinterred them across the street in that burial ground, threw our bones away. Mm. So I said, no, this is a partial African burial ground. When you go there, you're going to see I got the city council to um, co-name that whole square African Burial Ground Square. I got wow. the sign under Barbie, under Skank, under Livonia, African Burial Ground Square. That park, my wife and I are going to turn that from Skank Park to Sankofa Park. 
and we're gonna Sankofa, put. I remember seeing right. a play on. Right, right. <laughs> so we're gonna bring culture to East New York and tell the story of those Africans who built East New York. And you know, the uh, indigenous people that were in East New York were the Canarsie so-called Indians. Canarsie. Canarsie, yeah. Canarsie, mm -hmm. the Rockaway so-called Indians. I say so-called because they were not Indians. Christopher Columbus was lost. He was looking for India, and everywhere he came, he said, oh, Indians, <laughs> Indians. You got East Indians, Wendians, Arawaks, you know, <laughs> um, Carib Indians, that's where Caribbean, yeah, yeah, Caribbean, Caribbean came yeah. from. Oh, those are his historical mistakes. He never discovered anything other than that he was lost. You can't discover a place where people already exist. Exactly. So in, in East New York, it was the Kanasi, the Lenape, the Rockaway Indians were in East New York. Wow. And they scattered them out, and they went to the outskirts. And then the Dutch took over, and then after the Dutch, the English. And then all the way up to 1960, there was Italians, Jews, and then we came after. From 60 to 66, 80% white to 80% black. That's how East New York turned black when we had to build it. Let me ask you about um, Bernie Sanders, because I have an issue with him regarding him um, saying yeah to the uh, to the crime bill versus um, Hillary Clinton advocating for it. I think him saying yes to it is worse than Hillary Clinton advocating for it. And I say that for the simple fact that I did some research and I looked at how the crime bill originated and uh, who wrote it. It's crazy because uh, Joe Biden actually wrote right. the crime bill. He's in there, <laughs> he's in there with, with Obama. But a, a dude, uh, I forgot his name, but he some a guy from Texas sponsored the bill. Mm -hmm. Now, what's particular about the bill was that it started on the, the House floor, then it went to the Senate. Um, Sanders said yes to it on the House floor. It went to the Senate, and those, the Senate, and those provisions went in there with the um, where where Sanders was like uh, the reason he voted for it was because of those provisions. Hmm. But he said yes to it for it to go to the Senate before yeah. those provisions was even. Right. In it. He tried to use the excuse that in most bills, like a lot, very few bills are with nothing else but that particular issue. Mm -hmm. So in that bill, he claims was the I banned the assault rifle. Yeah, so, but that assault was on it. But that was on. See, my, my thing with that is he should have known with that bill as far as with the mass incarceration. He should have been aware of what that go do. That assault bill, that was only for 10 years. Yeah. And then he also said about the domestic violence money for now. So that tells me that white people to him are more important than black people. Basically. Because the mass incarceration tops all of that stuff. You can get, you can, I know about budgets. You can get money for domestic violence in other parts of the budget. You don't have to have it in that crime bill. Yeah. And then the salt weapons, I don't mean to be cold, but. We don't be using that in the hood. <laughs> no. You know, I'm just saying, I mean, I don't think anybody should be killed, but that's because those white boys, you know, get the assault weapons and go into schools and shoot up. So he, he's in Vermont. There's probably three black people in Vermont. He has no clue who we are. My biggest problem was the crime bill with him <clears throat> was the fact he supported the Afghani war and that he said no to reparations. Someone mm -hmm. told me he changed his mind. But when you tell me that reparations is divisive, that even a study of reparations, I'm doing a reparations bill for the state. Reparations just means that you worked us for free and you owe us. Basically. You can't work us for 246 years for free and then say uh, to the descendants, forget about it, that's a long time ago. The Jews got paid for their Holocaust, the ones that were directly involved in the Holocaust and their descendants. The Japanese in 1991 under Reagan, or 88 or 91 under Reagan, they got paid $1.2 billion for their internment in 1945. Mm -hmm. you remember when Pearl Harbor hit? Yeah, yeah. Right. They rounded up all the Japanese and put them in concentration mm -hmm. camps. They got paid for that. Mm -hmm. Reparations. See, reparations is a debt owed. What I don't like about Bernie, about that one, that's why I'm writing in as a protest in November. 
I'm writing in a candidate. His first name is Reparation, and his last name is Now. That's what, <laughs> that's what I'm writing in, because I am not voting for either one of them. I cannot go with Clinton or not, and it doesn't matter as much. I know people are going to throw the scare. You got to stop Trump. He's crazy. Stop Trump. That's how the Democrats get us, because the Republicans are always worse. So they have you stopping somebody instead of starting them. I'm not going to vote just to stop Trump. We'll survive him, too. Mm -hmm. And part of me, yeah. I'm only saying it on your show, if he wins, maybe we'll have the revolution, because that's let a me, crazy let me, man. Let me, let me, <laughs> no, no, no. Exactly. You wanna, let me tell you something. <clears throat> I've been telling Jamel this for a minute. I believe that we need Trump. We need a wake up call. Yeah, we need Trump. You know, we. Need, I mean, I agree with him. I didn't disagree. We need Trump to basically wake up our people because our people have been asleep for the past mm -hmm. couple of decades. The younger generation, yeah. not your generation. Me, a part of me feels that way, but this is the real deal, brothers. Right. We had Giuliani and didn't wake up. Exactly. We had Bush and didn't wake up. Right. We had Reagan and didn't wake up. So I'm not down with that. We got to have somebody worse so that we could wake up. See, but. A part of me <laughs> does agree. <laughs> There's another part that right. says, Bush well, was if no he does, maybe we will. See, you know what I like see, about- uh, And Bush was no good, like I told no, you. No, you know, but you want me to tell you. Okay. What I like about Trump is Trump drawing that line in the sand. And he's saying, look, this is the side I'm on. Giuliani and them wasn't really that clear. They hid behind laws and-, and Well, Giuliani was clearer than- um, Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was kind of clear. That's why I have problems with Bill de Blasio. How do you- bring in Bill Bratton, who was Giuliani's yeah, police commissioner, yeah. the most racist, vile mayor we've ever yeah. had. You bring in his police commissioner? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you are a progressive? Right. You know, so, uh, you know, I really think local politics is where it's at. Whatever happens, is, you're not going to control that. The only reason why the blacks want Hillary in, because they'll have access to her, and they'll get little things. Mm -hmm. That's why they didn't support Barack Obama. These black leaders supported Hillary Clinton because they didn't have access to Obama. And then when he started whipping her, they came on later. The mm -hmm. Congressional Black Caucus yeah, you're talking about. Exactly, later. yeah. They was with Hillary when Obama was running because they wanted access. And their access just means photo ops for them, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. Photo ops come to my convention and, you know, have all these people come. But your access to that power means nothing only for yourself. So we got to look at local politics. And, and I forgot to finish telling you, the unicameral body of the city council has a lot of power. And we are the majority in New York City. New York City has 8 million people. 65% right. of New York City is black, Latino, and Asian. Only 30 some odd percent is white. Over 50% of the city council is people of color. White, I ran for mayor for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was broke. I ain't had no real money. <laughs> so the, uh, one of the reporters said, um, how are you going to, how are you going to get the um, white vote? I said, you mean the minority vote? He said, no, the white vote. I said, yeah, it's the minority. <laughs> I don't have to get the minority vote. <laughs> I want to get the majority vote. Exactly, <laughs> so exactly, yeah. White people ain't voting for me, mm -hmm. so I ain't trying to say nothing to get their vote. I'm going to speak my truth to my people, and that's how I'm going to win. And I told them that for the first time in the history that year, the majority of the voters in the November election were people of color. Whites are minorities. But you know what they do to keep us in the minority mentality? You know what they call us? The minority majority. Mm -hmm. I heard. I heard that. You heard term that before. expression. I heard that how, term, the hell, yeah. how the hell are you going to be a minority majority? I heard, I heard right. that term before. Oh, the minority is now the majority. No, 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 no. We are the majority. You are the minority. Yeah. Minorities. You're gonna need. If I become mayor, they're gonna need affirmative action. Yeah. You, <laughs> you know. You know that the uh, the whites is, aren't the uh, majority of the police department no more either. Yeah, I, did, I, heard I, did, that's I did. I did. Too. I did. I did research on that. Actually, the uh, the the black and Latinos are increasing. Yeah, and, and but I'm, not in the power position. Yeah, but you know what I'm figuring now is that <clears throat> since they are the majority now, it's gonna be more police convictions. I totally believe that. And the well, contract. You know, the only problem with that is that some of the blacks on the department become blue. Oh, they, without they a doubt, they all become blue. Yeah. yeah. 
And then the system, because there's no history of them convicting even black cops. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there's racism in there somewhere, but the bottom line is that they all become blue, and they become one big blue family. Mm -hmm. And the, and the the we don't have a court system. See, the biggest problem is not just that the cops are killing us, is that the American system is letting them off. Mm -hmm. People are talking about taking down the Confederate flag. I'm concerned about the American flag. <laughs> 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 That's, you know, some people say, Charles, because, you know, in the uh, state assembly, we stand up for the prayer, and then they say, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and I sit down. <laughs> so all of them, I don't pledge allegiance to yeah. the United States of America. So all of them, um, my colleagues were upset with me, so why can't you just stay outside? Until we finish. I said, because I'm, I'm, this is my seat. I earned it, and I don't pledge leave. How could you do that? I said, let me tell you why. When Betsy Ross was stitching the American flag, we were catching stitches in slavery. Basically, more than that. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. So I'm not that. You know what the white stands for me? White power. Mm -hmm. You know what the red stands for me? Our blood. Mm -hmm. You know the blue stands for me? Your blue patriots that are honoring white power and the killing of us. That's what that flag symbolizes for me. It doesn't symbolize patriotism and liberty. Why would I say I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America for which it stands one nation under God? <laughs> Indivisible? <laughs> With liberty <laughs> and justice, justice for, for all. all. Yeah, right. And justice for all. Justice, justice for, for all. Justice for who? <laughs> justice for them. Yeah. I'm not pledging to that because my mama said, don't pledge to a lie. I can't. <laughs> just, please, justice is not blind. Right. Just, justice has 2020 vision. <laughs> right. You know? So I don't, I don't, um, you know, salute the flag. The only time I, I leave is like if I do a graduation for children. Like in an elementary school, and I'm the speaker, and I see the color guard coming in. I said, where's the bathroom? <laughs> I got to go to the men's room. I don't want the kids to have see me sitting there say, Mommy, why are you sitting down? Yeah. I don't have a chance to explain it so that they can enjoy their graduation. I'll just leave. But, you know, we got to take a stance, you know, and, and, and raise the contradictions. Now, 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 yeah, go ahead. now I, 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 I got to get this question off for um, – you know our, you know members of our union who are listening and everything. Um, first of all, I want the members to to know who don't know that you supported us in 2005. Sure did. When we struck, when Roger Toussaint led the strike. Um, what I want to know is, how do you feel about the Taylor Law, and do you think that there will ever be Taylor Law reform? It has to be. You know, the Taylor Law shouldn't forbid people to strike when you have a management that has so much power. I mean, you're really basically taking the power away from the worker and putting them at the mercy of management. So unless, you know, there's some ways that you can empower workers more, and I understand what they're saying, there's certain essential services you shouldn't be able to strike. Well, damn it, pay them then. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to strike, pay them. So I think that they should abolish it. I don't think it's, you should be... You're taking the only power that you have against a powerful yeah. management. Yeah. And and if they don't want teachers to strike, if they don't want police to strike, if they don't want transit workers to well, damn it, pay them. Yeah. Pay them. You can't, you can't, this is the richest country in the world. Right. Trust me, exactly. you know, I've seen budgets. You know, I've seen budgets. I remember Bloomberg, me and him used to argue with every budget. You know, he would say, you know, one of the things they try to get you on is when you say, why don't you do this budget? Where, where are we going to find the money? So I would go through the budget. I remember I telling Bloomberg one year, I said, Mayor, we need to put $200 million of capital money and build four state-of-the-art youth centers for, 40, for $50 million each, you know, mm -hmm. in the high crime areas. He said, where are you going to find the money, Charles? I said, I was waiting for you. I'm waiting for that. <laughs> one. So look at, I said, look at the capital budget. I mean, turn to page 39. You see where it says um, trees, $283 million. I love trees, Mayor. 
But I think we should do eighty three million for the trees and two hundred. He put those trees, those tree line blocks. Know, he went crazy for those trees. Remember yeah, that? I remember. <laughs> yeah. And I said, "How are you gonna have all of that money for trees and you won't have money for a youth center? Build the trees, but we'll do it gradually. Yeah. Take two hundred million from there. But if you don't want to take it from there, I got other places. You have a multi billion dollar capital budget. That's separate from the eighty three billion dollar expense budget you know all budgets are expense and capital expenses like the program money the money for the city and state agencies the capital money is to build bridges to build the infrastructure that's a separate budget mm -hmm. the school budget is 24 billion dollars mm. separate from the 83 billion wow i left the mta budget at 12 billion dollars might be higher now. And now. they always find money after they sell. Oh, they the had right. cookbooks. They had two books. Yeah, yeah. They I'm, always they always <laughs> talk about their broke. They cookbook. They're not broke. See, they then this place is never broke. How could a hundred and fifty six billion dollars the state budget is a hundred and fifty six billion dollars? You know how much the governor put in it for poverty? How much? Twenty five million. Wow. wow. Lunch money. That's lunch money. Right, right. And Ten, you know ten, where the poverty is going to be? In 10 counties upstate. I said, how could we let him get away with that? I talked to him. I was purple. I said, you, Martin Luther King died in 1968 uh, uh, developing a poor people's campaign against poverty. He wanted John Conyers who just had gotten in Congress. That's when they was going to go to Congress and, and, yes, and take the people and, and hang out there Come on now. and bring them to their door. We're going to bring them to yes, your doorstep. Yes. <laughs> so you know what I love about Martin Luther King? When I was in the Panthers, we thought he was sell out Big Uncle Tom, Big Six, and all of that. Malcolm told us that. But I respect Dr. King. See, you know what they do? They freeze us. They freeze our leaders in history. They freeze him in 1963. I have a dream. He died in 1968 with a radical vision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King said, maybe America should equitably distribute its wealth and move toward a democratic socialist society. Dr. King. Dr. King said there should be a radical rearrangement of the social, economic, and political order of America. Revolution. Mm. He went in 68, not to make speeches. They set up Resurrection City, and they were going to they were gonna do civil disobedience at all of the places. They were going sit, to sit on the, mm -hmm. the runway of the airport and not let planes take off until they passed that $60 billion poverty bill. Mm -hmm. So Shopton, all of them civil rights leaders, be like King. King wasn't sucking up to Johnson, LBJ. Mm -hmm. When Andy Young and them said, Dr. King, man, you shouldn't be speaking out against that war. You're messing with the president. And Dr. King said, well, is this about y'all getting a program from the president? <laughs> this is Dr. King talking to Andy and them. So do we do all of this? He said, listen, there's always the right time to do the right thing. This is not the time. It's always the right time to do the right thing. Yeah. And Dr. King was frozen in history. I have a dream. Rosa Parks was frozen in history. When Rosa sat down, we all stood up. But you should have checked Rosa Parks out when she moved to Detroit yeah. and joined the Freedom Party yeah. and fought for reparations yeah. and said, I love Dr. <coughs> King, but Malcolm X was my hero, yeah. Rosa Parks. Yeah. What, what happened between with our leaders? Like It seemed like our real leaders got assassinated or they from your era. Like Where are the young leaders of today? Well, you know, I'm very fortunate to have around me, and we're developing some young, radical leaders like Malika Jabali, who is a co-chair of Operation Power, along with Tariq Washington. And these two young folks grew up in the movement. Tariq comes from the Iman family, uh, Paul Washington and Peggy Washington, who was with us in the Black United Front and the movement. Malika comes from Atlanta, and her mother, you heard of the Shrine of the Black Madonna in Atlanta, Black Liberation Theology. Okay. You want to get white folk upset, say Jesus was black like he really was. <laughs> <laughs> I make a lot of speeches. <laughs> the minute I say that, I said, you know, y'all need to cut this racism out because if you make it to heaven and you see a brother come around the corner, that's going to be God. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to get you for that. But 
she came out of that movement. She came out of the Malcolm X movement with Shokwe Lumumba, and may he rest in peace. Remember the brother was the, yeah, yeah. the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So him, them two, Quran and others, there are, there are some young black radicals coming up, but right now there's only two voices in the national mix, liberals and conservatives. Mm -hmm. We have to bring that black radical. That's why I do the things I do, say the things, besides the fact that that's what I am and that's what I believe, but I purposely go overboard with it because there's no black radical voice out there that has any juice in, a, in, a, in an elected position. Not, beside my wife and I, there are no real black radical elected officials in New York State. Wow. All of them are either liberals progressives or conservatives there's no and see here's the difference and you asked an excellent question because that's you, something that we really have to work on you know what a liberal is a liberal is the blacks that believe that capitalism is salvageable they want to reform it they just want a piece of the action they want equality they want to justice they want to be let in so they believe in the capitalist system charlie Rangel, david dinkins and all of them and al shopton and jesse and all of them they those are progressives because they believe in the system and they just believe that they march enough and fight enough that they're going to be let in that's not going to happen no so they think it should be reformed you know tax the rich regulate wall street Give us some poverty programs, you know, so on and so forth. Then there's the conservative black who says, ain't nothing wrong with the system. It's you lazy Negroes. Yeah. Pull yourself up by your bootstrap. <laughs> Stop having babies out of wedlock. You know, you know why we have poverty? Because we have single parent homes because you left your woman. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they let racism off the hook. You know, anybody that has an analysis of the condition of black people that doesn't include our oppressor will always conclude blaming the oppressed. Yeah, That's yeah. the conservative. They want to conserve, conserve. this. Mm -hmm. And then it's me, the, the radical, radical <laughs> the revolutionary. <laughs> Capitalism is not salvageable. It is inherently a blood-sucking system. It's been around for 200 years. Our poverty has increased. 27.4% of us are in poverty under Obama. Only 25% was in poverty under Bush. Mm. Not blaming Obama. That's the capital of the system. Yeah. So it's not salvageable to me. It will never, it is not designed to bring equitable distribution of wealth. It is not designed to close the income gap or the wealth gap. It's widening as we speak. Yes. So this system to me has to be destroyed. Question is how, with who, when, and how do we not fall with it? Because it is falling. And remember, in his last years, what did Martin Luther King say? I don't know if we should integrate into a burning house. Mm -hmm. Because he knew then capitalism was failing. And it's failing right now. All over the world, people are rising up. How, why do you think they can never beat the Palestinian people with all of that power? Because Huey Newton once said, the spirit of people is greater than the technology of man. No weapon, the Bible says, formed against us shall ever prosper. Mm -hmm. So we are going to win. That's why I'm always optimistic. Yeah. It doesn't look that way yeah. because, you know, you see all of the stuff around us. But we are going to win. Yeah. And I see these young radical voices coming up, but it's just – Needs to be accelerated. We need much more. Now, let me tell you, this the fastest two hours has oh, ever so, went. Oh, man, tell me about it. <laughs> has ever went tell since, since it's we over were. already. I yeah. want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how about this? We would like to have you back sometime soon. I'd be glad. To. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. We want mm -hmm. you to. Can you leave the people with a final word? A firm final word. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I said, don't hold. The, like, don't hold no punches. No punches. No, yeah, I punches. just want to leave it with some optimistic. You know. They say an African proverb is the only way to eat an elephant is just one bite at a time. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Life is hard if you take it by the yard, but it's a cinch if you take it inch by inch, 
We are going to win. We are winning right now. And don't ever believe your biological eyes in front of you when you see the poverty in our neighborhood. You see us killing ourselves and gangs and some of our brothers wearing their pants down and our women act in certain ways. Our oppression is not permanent. Any leader that believes in the permanency of our oppression is not fit to lead us. All empires rise and they fall. So we're going to win, and I say to the people out there, the struggle may be long, but our victory is certain. Wow, it's very powerful. Very right deep. <laughs> very powerful. Very deep. Well, look, it was a pleasure. My pleasure. Of us to, to have you here, our first politician. That's right. Probably the only radical I, one that we ever go have. Me, excuse me, I am an elected revolutionary. I'm not a politician. <laughs> elected. I apologize. I accept your apology, <laughs> bro. I yeah. apologize. Well, let, me, let me just hear you say elected revolutionary. Elected revolutionary. Okay, I like that. Now we can talk. Continue. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Have, have, and it was also an education. A true education. A true education. And, and from and an educator. Some people go be mad at this interview. Some people go graciously accept it. Well, with two hands. That's how they do it in Africa. When you accept <laughs> the gift, you, you accept it with both hands. Right. So this this it was a pleasure. Like you are somebody that I looked up to Thank before you. like this was talked into reality of having Mr. Barron on the show. That's right. And you know And it came true. Yeah. It thank really thank, came thank true. thanks to Mr. Anthony Staley. It's my man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. this is just the beginning. This is progressive action. We we created this show for a voice, a radical voice, because that's what they call me. Good. And, 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 yeah, they it's call a compliment. Me. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not mad at it. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and this is just the beginning. We going to take uh, a tour through your neighborhood. Please. Mm -hmm. um, we go we go work that out, and we go continue to bring the information, the knowledge, the truth, because that's what's missing. You don't find a lot of honest people out here that's going to tell you what's really going on. And the truth do something to people. It's either going to make you mad or it's going to educate you, depending on which end of the Correct. spectrum that you on. Right, because definitely I'll never look at East New York the same. And I, and I, I grew, up, I grew up, I'm, I'm, I'm from there, and I was a mail carrier out there too in both zip codes, 07 and 08, and back guess, in the days. Guess who named East New York East New York? John R. Pitkin. Pitkin Avenue? Pitkin Avenue. Don't John, tell me he was a slave owner too. No, he was a businessman from Connecticut who came in and saw all of the Dutch had all of that farm. He wanted to move it from agriculture to industry. And he bought up some of the place, and he wanted to make it look like East New York and like New York City, so he called it East of New York. East of New York, right? Okay. Wow. Okay. okay. See, that's how East New York got its name. Exactly. Wow, man. Well, look, that was the Progressive Action Radio Show today. I gotta end it off with some <laughs> with some claps. <laughs> There's a lot of good things going on today. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. Well, that was our show. Thanks for tuning in. Look, we need y'all to join the uh, Facebook group, Progressive Action. We need y'all to follow the Instagram page, Progressive Action. We want y'all to email us with, with, with uh, questions, guests, whatever, ProgressiveAction100 at Gmail. Matter of fact, Mr. Barron, you have a, like, where can the people reach you? Well, they can call me at my office at 718-257-5824. 718-257-5824. Well, there you go. That was the show. Y'all enjoy yourself. We'll be back next next week. Go be crazy. All right. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> good night.